All right, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm calling the 71st Annual Gulf Coast Tree Commission meeting to uh, order. This meeting is a little bit different than our in-person meeting, so I'm going to let our executive uh, executive director review how it'll work. First of all, I want to thank everyone in advance for your patience as we connect from all these different areas. Um, Dave, I don't know how you want to do the introductions or if you want to say how the meeting's going to work first. How do you want to do that? Uh, well, uh, I'll 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 kind of go over go over some of the um, uh, some of the procedures. Uh, I'll talk about the voting, and then and then I guess I guess uh, uh, it looks like we've got everybody listed. That there's there's a couple of callers that I'm not sure who who they are, but uh, um, um, unfortunately we all we've all become we've all kind of become experts at, on these on, at these online meetings. So um, we all kind of know what to do, but if you're not talking, please mute your phone. So, so uh, to uh, prevent any, any background noise. Um, uh, what we've done, you know, s some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, online options allow you to raise your hand. This the go to meeting doesn't have that option. So if you want to talk, um, either just jump in or uh, you can post something on the on the uh, on the chat that you'd like to you'd like to say something. So um, uh, it, it it appears that 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 we have the majority of of, of our uh, uh, our commissioners on. Um, Senator Alon and Chris Nelson were the only two that 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 I thought might be joining us that 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 I don't see. Are either of those uh, either of those gentlemen have either of those gentlemen joined since since we started talking? So if not, I, we still uh, we do have a quorum, Mr. Chairman. Um, voting. Uh, uh, as in the past, voting shall be by by state commissioner with one vote for for uh, for each uh, each commissioner with a total of 15. In the event that there's a dissenting a vote, then each state delegation uh, to the commission shall cast a vote and uh, uh, with will determined by the de determine of the will be determined by the majority of their delegates for a, a total of five votes. Um, but we do have a we do have a uh, um, a uh, a quorum, and uh, before we get started, I have one small item that I'd like to uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, to state uh, uh, some some recognition. Uh, recently, uh, the a commission employee has reached a, a major milestone that that's worth noting. Allie Wilhelm, who I believe is on the call, um, who is the sport fish and, and A and S uh, staff assistant and, tra and our travel coordinator, uh, just recently set celebrated 10 years with the commission. Uh, she's helped advance the commission, uh, commission's objectives, and I look forward to working with her for a, uh, 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 look forward to working with her in, in, in the future. So uh, if you would, uh, get, please give her a virtual uh, round of applause for, for, for her for accomplishments. So, uh, and it, it looks like- Thank you. Looks, it looks like Chris Nelson. Ah, looks like Chris Nelson is here. Chris, are you are you on? Were you able to get on or? Yeah, I'm on. Um, okay, I great. don't have audio. I don't have audio on my uh, laptop. I've got to get. That's fine. But but I'm 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 on the audio via my phone. If that's okay. That's perfect. I I'm glad uh, glad glad for you to join us. So, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I will turn it back to you. Thanks, Dave. Congratulations, Allie. Um, so I guess from this, we'll go on to the adoption of the agenda. So I need a motion to adopt the agenda as it is. I make the motion to adopt the agenda. Second. So I have a motion by Scott, a second from Chris. Any further discussions? Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. So we'll move on to the approval of the March 12th, 2020 meeting minutes. 
I'm looking for a motion. Hopefully you guys have had a chance to read those over. I think Dave and, and them sent them out a while ago. So I need a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second, Scott. A motion by Reed and a second from Scott. Any further discussion? Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. So from there, we'll move on to the, uh, the standing committee reports. Uh, Darren, are you ready for the TCC report? Yeah, I'm ready. You hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, during the virtual meeting of the TCC yesterday, uh, Jeff Brester provided a brief overview of the CMAP 2021-2025 management plan. Uh, following the discussion about the content of the plan and some of the sections that it figured are more appropriate for operations plan, the TCC directed staff to take a look back at the plan, take it back to the Caribbean and South Atlantic CMAP components, and uh, work on removing the information that does not really fit in the management plan, and bring it back to the TCC at their March meeting in 2021. Uh, Jeff Russell also presented the Gulf States CARES Act activities. Uh, Jeff will be providing an overview of the program's activities under the agenda item in your meeting today on 11D. Uh, Charlie Robinson, Robertson uh, updated the TCC on the Gulf States New Fisheries Restoration Program and the activities that he is currently working on in conjunction with the project management team. Uh, Charlie will be providing an overview as well of the program's activities under agenda item 11H today. Uh, Steve Vanderkoy presented on the IJF research funding that will support different projects in the, in the states. He provided an overview of the projects that will be funded this year and will address a number of the state data and research needs. Uh, he will be providing as well some detail later in this program uh, under agenda item 11A today. Uh, the TCC also had a brief discussion on the SOPs for the TCC subcommittees. And uh, following the discussion, the TCC made a motion and I move to approve the SOPs as written and send them to the full commission for approval. I'm going to pause there and I believe they're going to put the motion up on the board for you. So the motion is the TCC moves to approve the SOPs as written and to send them to the full commission for approval. So I need a motion to approve the motion, right, Dave? Uh, correct. To, to approve the SOPs, essentially. SOPs. Motion to approve, Michael. Second, Jason. So I have a motion by Paul and a second from Jason. Any further discussion? Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in the subcommittee reports, uh, first with artificial reef, James Bauer reported that the subcommittee discussed the impacts of recent hurricane on artificial reefs in North Carolina, Alabama, and Florida. The discussion finally uh, remained mainly focused on the movement of sediment, which exposed hard bottom or uh, relic tree stumps as well uh, that are impacting new permits. Although Florida stated that some of these stumps were exposed off their coast, but they eroded fairly quickly. The group also discussed recent concerns with sea turtle entanglements on new artificial reef projects. Several states are being asked to provide biological opinions for new reef projects and stipulations are being added to new permits to clean monofilament from the reef sites annually to address the entanglement concern. Uh, because of this issue and previous concerns about sea turtle entanglement in artificial reefs, the group decided to start exploring the possibility of having a national sea turtle plan for artificial reefs developed similar to the national guidance uh, that BMPs for preparing vessels intended to create artificial reefs. Uh, the group also discussed the possibility of having national standards for assessing artificial reef permits developed and or updating national reef plan to address inconsistencies in the permit process. The group will continue to have these discussions with a dedicated session at their next joint meeting. In the data management subcommittee, Steve Browns stated that Dave Blockner gave a presentation on the Gulf shrimp fishery, including analytical requirements, program updates, and reporting options. Blockner 
mentioned that the 3G technology they're currently using by the electronic logbooks is being discontinued uh, January 1st, 2021. Therefore, uh, it requires new shrimp data, effort data collection methods and report reporting requirements. He presented four possible options for vessel reporting and stated that NIMS will ask the, the Gulf Council to consider either making changes to the expiring uh, electronic logbook effort data collection program or require shrimp dealer permits and all permitted shrimp dealers to submit weekly electronic reports to NIMS. He also mentioned to the need for increased timeliness of shrimp data from the state partners for the monthly shrimp reports used by the Southern Shrimp uh, Alliance. But this is essential for producing an analysis for the Texas closure by, by the February council meeting. NIMS would need to be the current year's shrimp landings through August by the end of November of the same year. All the state partners indicated that they could likely provide preliminary shrimp data by the requested deadline. Each state provided an update on the research regarding the accuracy of shrimp commercial conversion factors. All the states have completed data collection and processing and results are being compiled. Uh, the results were presented at the data management subcommittee meeting in October of 2019 and work on the final report has begun. Preliminary results do not show major differences between current research um, conversion factors and the historical conversion factors. Uh, Greg Bray reported that the Gulf states continues to work on the transition away from paper reporting methods for marine recreational information program, MREP, access point angler intercept surveys. Uh, the process has been implemented in the Atlantic coast. And the Gulf States Fishery Management Council is utilizing the same technology. Currently, Atlantic Coast Cooperative Statistics Program has assisted Gulf Council in installing a database for housing data collected through the tablets. Um, the commission staff are also in the process, the Gulf States Commission staff are also in the process of purchasing the first, let me go back, I actually, the, currently the Atlantic Coast uh, Cooperative Statistics Program has assisted Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission in installing a database for housing data collected tablets. And this Gulf Council staff are also in the process of purchasing the first batch of tablet devices along with the needed accessories. Um, Gulf States Commission also has a contract in place with Harbor Light Software to modify the reporting application to meet the needs of the Emirates states in our region. Both state and federal partners will be utilized to assist in that process of modifying the application. The goal is to begin training and testing in the fall 2020, pretty soon, with the hope of being fully implemented by January 1st, 2021. In the Molluscan Shellfish Subcommittee, Carolina Bork reported that Chad Hansen from Pew Charitable Trust refreshed everyone on the restoration projects by Pew. Hansen reviewed the efforts nationwide to rebuild fish populations and end overfishing as well as provide management of ecosystem friendly projects. She was currently working to inventory oyster restoration pro projects throughout the region to see what models are available compared to what's needed for restoration site selection. Seth Blitch, the Nature Conservancy, gave an overview of the history of oyster restoration and recovery in the Gulf of Mexico. Blitch explained that the Gulf of Mexico still represents opportunity for oyster restoration as the resources continue to decline. Dr. Eric Salant uh, presented on the Gulf Oyster Consortium, which is a five-year project funded through the Commission and NOAA Office of Aquaculture. The project has four major components define project objectives to address industry needs for seed and genetic lines of seed, to breed lines with improved genetic values, characters of interest to industry, to develop a germplasm repository to include founders and selected parents during the successive generations of breeding, to test improved diploid lines for triploid performance and cross with the tetraploid stock. That's a mouthful. To date, the consortia has collected founders from different geographic lines incorporated in the mosaic strain, cryopreserved material from those founders and attempted spawns with limited success due to delays resulting from COVID shutdown. Additional spawns will be conducted once reproductive condition of the broodstock founders has improved. Uh, the subcommittee also had discussion on oyster importation and biosecurity 
since there are a number of issues related to sources of seed and broodstock in hatcheries and oyster farms, the subcommittee summarized the individual state restrictions and limitations for bringing material into their respective waters. In general, any shell stock from the U.S. East Coast is not permitted to be introduced into water anywhere in the Gulf due to concerns over the introduction of MSX. Live oysters can be brought into most as long as they are only going to restaurants or handled by processors. In general, though, most states also require health certifications for products brought from other regions for culture or grow out. It is suggested that the subcommittee may need to consider the importation rules to allow hatcheries outside of the Gulf to propagate seed to be returned to the state of origin just to meet demand. Based on the work being done by the Oyster Consortium, there may be potential for cryopreserved material across state lines and regions for hatchery purposes. It is unclear if the importation regulations and restrictions would apply to frozen reproductive material in lieu of sending live broodstock. Now, the Interstate Shelf Fish Sanitation Conference I requested information from the Mississippi DMR specifically about how they're reporting oyster production from off bottom farms. The standard for wild landings is in shuck meat yields, which is most states with oyster farms are reporting. However, since cultured oysters are generally sold smaller than legal wild oysters, their weights may be different, especially for triploids. And the value is significantly different as well, which could be an issue when generating dioxide prices and value compared to sack oysters. This might be an issue for MSSC and we'll need to address in the near future. In the CMAP subcommittee, Jeff Resser reported the CMAP subcommittees met jointly in July with the Caribbean and South Atlantic CMAP components. CMAP is unsure of the FY 2021 fund, but planned on level funding of approximately 4.79 million. At this level, the Gulf would receive approximately 1.9 million next year for fishery independent sampling in the Gulf of Mexico. Jeff provided an overview of the various 2020 CMAP surveys and details of the surveys will be covered in this program this meeting today under the agenda item 11C. With all the reduced sampling this year due to COVID, CMAP has unused funding, so the study committee has been discussing ideas on how to use these funds over the next year. Ideas put forward include purchasing an acoustic camera to support reef fish sampling, skull calibration tests, a joint habitat mapping training crews, uh, using hydroacoustics and trawl surveys, purchasing equipment to update vessels used in CMAP surveys, purchasing a CTD, supplementing sea days for the summer and fall shrimp groundfish surveys, and paying for travel to an invertebrate identification workshop. In the CMAP subcommittee, Ted Schweitzer was elected chair and Jill Hinden was elected vice chair. In TCC, we also had election of officers and Darren Topping, myself, was reelected as chair and Bev Sauls was reelected as vice chair. And that concludes my report. Thanks, Darren, that's a lot. Anybody have any questions for Darren before we move to approve the report? Kind of hard to tell. No questions? Well, this is Paul. Uh, I did have a question, Darren, uh, about the ISSC um, component of your report. Um, I didn't quite understand. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to uh, um, listen in on that meeting uh, earlier, um, but I didn't really understand. Uh, what was the request again? It was a, it was a meat uh, concern about meat size on landings from the off bottom and how it's different from on bottom, I think I caught. And also, um, why would the ISSC uh, request it from a single state agency when there's off bottom production in uh, other areas of the Gulf? Was that discussed? The last question, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I. The, the first question, going back to so the oyster sacks, what, what's going on is the landings from the trip ticket data coming in from the mariculture or aquaculture from oysters is coming in, well, it's converted to meat weights, but it comes in as either individual oysters or pounds of oysters in shell. It's, it's a, quite a few different ways of doing it, but you don't have the right conversion factors necessarily in each state to convert those to the, the, the meat weight because it's full well, triploids there may be some more work on the triploid as far as conversion factors. But I think the conversion factors they're currently using might be from diploid. 
I'm, I wasn't in, in involved in that conversation in the meeting, but I have some people who have been contacting me and, and I've been trying to figure out myself actually looking at literature to see if we can, if literature can to convert some of those values back to meat weight, but it's kind of all over the board right now. I'm still working on it. Sure. So that, I mean, that's kind of what the flag came up in my mind is we have different growth rates uh, in Florida and Alabama. Uh, every, each state has a, a pretty unique growth rate and uh, the harvest strategies are very different. Um, it's, it's all driven uh, by price and uh, an on bottom harvest, at least in Mississippi, is, is uh, you know, it's been done in the past with water quality and opening certain areas and seasons uh, and restrictions by, by ISSC and, and, and the FDA as well. But understanding that, uh, you know, the variation that we see in, in uh, style, uh, growth rate, and just overall industry uh, customizations for each state, you would think the um, the oyster weights and the, uh, I guess the extrapolations of mean weights uh, should be taken at a very uh, broad scale in the Gulf. Uh, if the ISSC needs to uh, obviously have those metrics for for their purposes of, of estimating landings, but it seems like it, it's a much more complicated uh, topic than. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe all this was discussed at the meeting, but it seems like there is a, there's some concern there that you know they could potentially go down a road of of getting a a weight from a single area which doesn't represent the Gulf, which is exactly I'm sure what they don't want to have happen. Thank you. Right. There's quite a few variables. Even I believe Alabama takes monthly they have monthly conversions for each one of their oysters as they change throughout the season in meat weight. So I mean my thought. I mean, trip tickets, when you convert it, you're getting a single number, you get a single conversion factor, you kind of trust and you have to go with the average across the board. And uh, so it might be good to have just a range of possible values for landing then for value based on kind of the lows and averages of what we're seeing conversion factors versus a single number. Thanks, Paul, for the question. Darren, you got any or any other questions for Darren? And with that, I guess Dan, this, this is Dave. Paul, I, I think that there was what? Hold on, Dan. You're good. OK, um, Paul, I, I, I think there was there was quite a bit of discussion in, in that in that subcommittee uh, meeting and and I, and I don't know if if, uh, uh, if Steve can can provide some some uh, some guidance on that discussion. So because uh, because I, I I think some of the issues that that uh, you were concerned about the the subcommittee was concerned about as well. So Steve, can you provide some clarification? Absolutely. I didn't I didn't know if I should jump in or not. Uh, in the meeting before the meeting, it was uh, it was brought up. From the DMR staff, Paul, that that they they had a question regarding how aquaculture products were being reported, and the standard NOAA oyster landings don't really seem to fit well with the the aquaculture product itself, being that it's sold as a half shell, not as a meat. Um, so we brought this up and just sort of asked the question around the table how everybody is reporting, and the consensus was that most people are converting to uh, meat weights, wet meat weights, uh, similar to what they're doing with, with traditional on bottom. And our discussion was perhaps there's a, a way we could begin to explore some additional reporting for aquaculture products because of the fact that you have diploid and triploid. Um, it's a shell product. It's got a lot more value than what the shuck product does individually. So that was just sort of beginning the discussions of how how is everybody reporting, and um, and uh, at this point in time we've got an opportunity to sort of reset that stage. Um, you know we historically looked at the differences in in sack weights and conversions and uh, the off bottom is a difficult process to work with to try to compare. We could actually begin to explore doing something that's uniform and standard in the Gulf. 
and we're going to look at what they're doing on the Atlantic because they've been and the Pacific. They've been reporting for a while. Sure, well, that sounds great. It sounds like uh, my my questions are echoing discussion points that were um, in the in the subcommittee, um, the Molluscan subcommittee itself. But I, I, I'm sure I, I would assume or ask, I guess, if the commission agrees that the standardization Gulf wide is is beneficial for all of us in future. Uh, disaster uh, relief efforts and and all those things for um, for the Gulf in general, as it is a competitive market and uh, the Gulf is uh, unique with its growth rates and uh, and an overall flavor and off bottom success that it's had. So um, standardizing us uh, in those competitive markets and in disaster relief efforts is uh, is advantageous. I would I would assume for all of us, and uh, I hope that gets echoed to the subcommittee next time they meet. Any other questions? With that, we need a motion to approve the Technical Coordinating Committee report. So Scott, this is Scott, second. A motion by Reed and then a second from Scott. Any further discussions? Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. We're going to move on to item B, which is state and federal. I think that, uh, Scott, I think that we're, Greg was going to do this, if I'm correct. Oh, yeah. He looks and sounds better on it virtually than I do, so he's going to take care of that for us. <laughs> You're too kind, and I disagree with you. But, uh, um, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a bit of a mouthful because I am presenting both the State Federal Fishery Management Committee report and the Menhaden Advisory Committee report to you today. Mr. Peter Himchak was going to provide the MAC report, but had a late conflict, um, so I'll provide the Commission with both those reports. The State Federal Fishery Management Committee met yesterday afternoon virtually with an agenda focused on 2021 proposed funding discussions related to Gulf Fin, CMAP, and the jurisdictional fishery small grants program i do have two committee motions to bring forward and if you're in agreement i would like to handle them one at a time as i come to them in the report that'd be perfect okay great thank you um, so i started by outlining the status of 2021 gulf fin funding for data collection and management activities Preliminary 2021 funding amounts for Gulf Fin and Rec Fin line items are based on the likelihood of operating under a continuing resolution and receiving level funding. The proposed amount available for Gulf Fin funding in 2021 totals $7.15 million. And the original amount proposed for 2021 for all high priority jobs was $6.83 million, which meant there was a surplus of approximately $322,000. So after a brief discussion, the State Federal Fishery Management Committee moved to fund the coordination and administration of Gulf Fin activities, collecting, managing, and disseminating marine recreational fisheries data, operation of the Fin data management system, and trip ticket program implementation and operations, and to forward this on to the full commission for their approval. That motion passed unanimously. And uh, Joe, I believe you have that motion. If you could put that on the board. So the motion, you're going to read it, Greg? Sure. The motion is the State Federal Fishery Management Committee moves to fund coordination and administration of, of fin activities, collecting, managing, and disseminating marine recreational fisheries data, operation of the fin data management system, and trip ticket program implementation and operation for a total budget of $6.83 million. That motion passed the committee unanimously. Any questions? So I need a motion to approve to move forward on funding coordination administration of FIN activities. Motion to approve. Read you second? Yeah, second, sure. I thought I saw your name up there. So I have a motion by Paul and a second from Reed. Any further discussion? 
Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The committee did discuss options for obligating and spending the surplus $322,000 in 2021. Uh, I stated I um, will be working with the Gulfin Committee and we will bring their recommendation back to the State Federal Fishery Management Committee for their consideration in the very near future. I also discussed funding the commissions received to support state survey work and funding we've received to um, support the Southeast For Hire Electronic Reporting Program or CFIRE. Both funding amounts are being tracked separately and can only be used for those specific tasks. The Modernizing Recreational Fisheries Management Act has allocated $300,000 annually to support state survey work, and it prioritizes developing, maintaining, and improving electronic data collection tools associated with the state surveys. NOAA Fisheries Southeast Regional Office has also provided funding to support a dockside validation survey to be implemented that will support the new federal for hire logbook reporting program under CFIRE. In 2020, Gulfin received 1.5 million to support year one dockside survey activities, and those are proposed to start on or about January 5th of 2021. Gulfin has been informed that $900,000 will be made available for ongoing costs for years two and beyond, and year two would be year um, 2022. Currently, year two costs are proposed around 1.15 million. But once survey work actually begins in 2021, the states may need to adjust their budgets as more information is gained on implementation costs. If the budgets do remain above proposed funding, all the partners will have to look at possibly reducing budgets and field work if that is even possible to fit within the proposed funding. Uh, Jeff Rester provided some background on the CMAP budget and surveys for the Gulf of Mexico. The FY 2020 CMAP appropriation was $5.125 million, and Jeff stated that CMAP received approximately $4.8 million for fishery independent sampling for all three CMAP components. All three CMAP components based their FY 2021 budget on level funding of $5.125 million. The total proposed for the Gulf was $2.04 million. The state federal fisheries management Breaking up. Can't hear you, Greg. Greg. And to forward this on to the full commission for their approval. The motion passed unanimously. We didn't, so, we didn't hear any of that, Greg. Yeah, you, you were breaking up an awful lot, so I don't know if you want go back over that or not well can't hear you again I, I i can um can you hear me now yeah all right yeah all right hold on How about now? Yep. Yep. Can you hear me now? Correct. Okay. Had to change hardware. Sorry about that. I'll start. I will start over with um, with the CMAP um, discussion. So Jeff Rester provided some background on the CMAP budget and surveys for the Gulf of Mexico. The FY 2020 CMAP appropriation was $5.125 million. And Jeff stated that CMAP received approximately 4.8 million for fishery independent sampling for all three CMAP components. All three CMAP components based their FY 2021 budget on level funding of $5.125 million. The total proposed for the Gulf was 2.04 million. The State Federal Fisheries Management Committee reviewed the various CMAP surveys along with their associated costs. For, for FY 2021, CMAP will continue the current CMAP survey work and sampling effort and hope that level funding or additional funding will be appropriated. After brief discussion, the State Federal Fishery Management Committee moved to accept the proposed funding for CMAP surveys for 2021 for a total budget of $2.04 million and to forward this on to the full commission for their approval. This motion passed unanimously. 
So I think it, the motion is the state and federal fisheries management committee move to accept the proposed funding for CMAP surveys for 2021 for a total budget of 20, uh, 2 million four. The motion passed unanimously. So I need a motion to approve the accept. I need a motion to approve the uh, proposed funding for CMAP surveys for 2021. If you motion to approve. I think everybody there were two or three voices there at the same time i didn't yeah i didn't get it. i got jason i got jason but didn't get a second Nicole, second. Second. so i have a motion by jason and a second from paul any further discussions any opposition hearing none motion passes Thanks, Thank Greg. You. That was an awful lot. So oh, any further questions? Oh, I'm not done yet. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've got a little ground to cover yet. I apologize. So I'll, I'll, okay. I'll be as efficient as possible here. So Steve Vanderkoy discussed the Interjurisdictional Fisheries Program Small Grants Funding Program. With increases in IJF funding, the program is supporting a small grants program to assist with important research priorities at the state level. A total of 1.4 million has been made available in 2020 from year one and two funding. Steve stated in 2021, there will be an additional 900,000 available split between the five states, which should total about 180,000 per state in 2021. He's gonna provide some more detail on this in his program report later in the agenda under item 11. For election of officers, Scott Bannon was nominated for chairman and Paul Mickle was nominated for vice chairman. Nominations were closed and both were approved unanimously by the committee. The Menhaden Advisory Committee met virtually in September and reviewed the usual agenda items related to the season. There are no action items to bring before the commission. The MAC requested an update on the motion passed in March requesting the commission update the Gulf Menhaden FMP. Staff explained that there were no changes to the fishery or the status of the population since the last revision to warrant an update and that updating would only be for MSC, which is a marketing tool and not a management issue for the states. Peter Himchak stated that the MAC may include the reference points modeling conducted by Butterworth and Rademeyer in the assessment update scheduled for next year, but the importance of having a regional management plan is necessary for the states that don't have individual ones. Staff indicated that the MAC was welcome to readdress this with the commission, but there would need to be justification as it relates to state management of the fishery or significant research advances in our understanding of the population. Ray Maroc provided a review of the 2020 Gulf fishing season. In the Gulf, the landings were down 8.5% compared to the same time last year. As everyone knows, it's been a strange year with the COVID pandemic and numerous tropical systems. Noah projected that if last NOAA projected that if last year's September and October were similar this year, the total for 2020 would be around 465,000 metric tons by the end of the season, which would only be a 4% decrease from 2019 and a 24% decrease from 2018. Ray Maroc also updated the group on the 2020 Texas cap. Carrie Jelpe was introduced as Jerry Mambretti. Mambretti's replacement on the committee as the TPWD representative as Jerry retired in August. The industry made a total of six sets in Texas waters in August and removed 2.24% or around 770,000 pounds of the 34.6 million pound cap so far in 2020. The industry continues to fish less to the west since the closure of the Cameron plant in 2015, so fishing in Texas is nearly negligible. Peter Himchak reported that because of the COVID issue, the Gulf's MSC certification was extended six months, so the year one client action plan will be due next spring. Mr. Cattell indicated that the NOAA Observer Steering Committee has been formed and the first agenda item was to develop a list of concepts to observe for turtle and protected species interactions. COVID has slowed that process as well. For the election of chairman, the next chair was set to be a state representative. Trevor Moncrief from the Mississippi DMR offered to serve, but noted he was not the actual member and wasn't sure if he could hold the position instead of Matt Hill. Peter Himchek suggested that without everyone being together and clear understanding of the proxy question, 
the election of chair would be deferred until the commission's spring meeting. Under other business, the MAC asked about the status of the proposed IJ research project submitted for consideration to the TCC. Staff reported that the State Federal Fishery Management Committee and the commission considered the proposal process and ultimately decided to split the available funds equally between the five agencies and allow each to determine what their priorities were. As a result, none of the MAC proposed projects were selected, although several monitoring proposals would indirectly include Menhaden. Steve Vandercoy reported that the Gulf Menhaden Ecosystem Modeling Team will be having a conference call October 22nd. The model is operational and may have potential for use in the assessment next year. Mr. Vandercoy will let the group know if a presentation is ready for the March meeting. The CDAR schedule has the Gulf Menhaden Operational Assessment occurring in the summer fall of 2021. Lastly, Ben Landry provided a short update on the industry's Cameron Parish GoFundMe campaign. He noted that Omega Protein has partnered with the Cameron Lions Club to spearhead the campaign to support relief efforts, with 100% of the contributions going directly to charitable assistance. So far, the campaign has raised $5,550 through the GoFundMe campaign toward a goal of $10,000. He invited anyone willing to contribute to he invited anyone willing to contribute to the assistance effort. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thanks, Greg. That's a lot. Any, any questions for Greg? No questions. Okay, with that, I need a motion to approve the State Federal Fisheries Management Committee report. Anyone? This is Reed, so moved. Second. Thank you, Jason. So I have a motion by Reed and a second from Jason. Any further discussions? Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. We're going to move down to item five, Sea Grant Fisheries Extension Meeting Report. Laura, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Chairman. Hi, everyone. Morning, uh, hey. Well, uh, so the Sea Grant Advisory Committee did meet virtually last Tuesday, October 6th, for our meeting. Um, our meeting largely dominated um, around some of the regional projects that the Sea Grant programs are involved in or becoming involved in that are occurring in the Gulf. Um, there are three projects in particular that are um, some significant kind of large scale Gulf wide projects or beyond um, that Sea Grant is engaging in. Um, the first project is the Amberjack Research Program, which um, some of you may be aware of. Uh, Congress appropriated funding to Sea Grant and NOAA, um, similar to the process that previously occurred for the Great Red Snapper Count, um, to enhance research for the greater Amberjack fishery to improve stock assessments. And so um, that that project it has been launched. Um, as a part of the project this year, or uh, this time around, there was a request that there be a stakeholder engagement phase prior to releasing the RFP for research as a way of helping to inform the research priorities for this. Uh, Florida Sea Grant is leading that component right now in a visioning phase. And so we are in the early stages of some um, stakeholder feedback process to uh, help inform that RFP. Um, there will be a series of listening sessions associated with that that will occur in either November or early December to help inform that process as well. Um, and those will be publicized and we plan to do those. Um, all of the state sea grant pro programs are involved from Texas actually all the way to uh, Virginia. Um, as this is this time around, this is a Gulf and South Atlantic um, process. So um, there will be listening sessions in most every state associated with this. Um, the goal is to actually have an RFP written by the end of the year and out by either late December or early January with a very quick turnaround time so that we can actually get research, you know, um, moving and out the door in early spring. So um, 
If anyone is interested in more information, both Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant and Florida Sea Grant have on their websites some additional information and fact sheets about the project. And we will be publicizing quite a bit more now that we've um, now that the pro project has launched. Um, the other two projects that are kind of Gulf wide co are coming out of the um, the NOAA Restoration Center work through the Open Ocean TIGS. Um, plan number two. And I know that a lot of those uh, have been presented to the commission already, so I won't go through all the details of the project, but to say that um, the Sea Grant programs are engaging in two of those projects, um, one being the project to reduce post-release post mortality from barrow trauma in the Gulf of Mexico refish recreational fisheries. Um, I know the commission is engaged in that project closely as well um, on the research side and state agency collaboration. Florida Sea Grant will be taking a leading role in that project to assist in outreach and communications and some of the evaluation aspects of the project. Um, so Florida Sea Grant is in the process of hiring a communications manager specifically to um, to spearhead the communication efforts for that um, fish de descending device project. And once that occurs, um, there's a plan in place to engage uh, the remaining Sea Grant programs around the Gulf as points of contacts to help with implementation for that project. Um, the other project through the NOAA Restoration Center is the Better Bird Project, as it's being dubbed, uh, which is the project to restore fish biomass through uh, reduced fin fish bycatch in the commercial shrimp fishery. The goal being to identify and develop some uh, new bycatch reducing, uh, bycatch reduction devices um, and to incentivize the use within the fishery to help um, increase finfish populations through restoration. Um, Louisiana and Sea Grant uh, and Texas Sea Grant are both going to be assisting the restoration center in that project. We are in the final stages of working through a lot of the project details on that project, but it's set to start in January and that is another um, six, six year project. These are both very long timeline projects. So um, those are kind of the three big Gulf wide efforts um, that the Gulf Fisheries Extension teams are working on at the moment. Um, the rest of our reports largely focused on discussions around our COVID and hurricane responses. It's been quite a year in the last six months since we've seen you all um, and obviously a lot to respond to um, which has kind of knocked us off of some of our um, typical programming. Um, the states, uh, so the National Office for Sea Grant actually did provide some small funds to each of the Sea Grant programs um, to help launch response efforts for COVID, and each of the states used utilized those funds in different ways. Um, but the prior, the the majority of those funds went in some way towards um, assisting with seafood marketing um, and seafood promotion type aspects as the seafood industry was hit very hard by COVID. Um, some of the states, including Florida and Mississippi, also used those those funds to um, purchase shellfish um, from uh, aquaculture program um, aquaculture farmers um, in Mississippi, Alabama. That was oyster, and in Florida, that was clams um, to utilize as restoration. Um, and so those were farmed products that were then um, purchased and utilized and put back out in the water for restoration projects. Um, a couple of the states did do very formal um, COVID response. So Louisiana did work closely with the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, or I should say are working closely um, on some surveys of COVID impacts throughout the marine um, economies. They are doing quarterly reports and Sea Grant actually does, or quarterly surveys, and they do actually have some results of those early surveys up on the Louisiana Sea Grant website. Um, and similarly, Florida is doing periodic surveys um, formally on COVID impacts. 
to track that. The other states recognizing that there's been quite a bit of you know, survey fatigue from multiple sources as well, have done more informal process to gain some insight into impacts um, for the industries. We've seen some very kind of mixed um, impacts and results in Texas. We had a lot of cancellation of tournaments this year, some very big tournaments that typically occur. But on the flip side, though, we had really early closures um, and issues for the charter industry. Um, we are hearing from them now that I mean they're just gangbusters. I mean they, you know, if basically the phrase is then if if you can't make it as a fishing guide right now in Texas, then you shouldn't be in the business because they're just booming while people are um, enjoying um, work from home in different aspects where they're able to get out on the water more. So um, it's been quite an interesting. Um, look at how the different industries have been impacted in different ways over time. Um, on top of that, as I mentioned, we are dealing with hurricane responses for Hurricane Laura, Hurricane Sally, and Hurricane Delta. Um, unfortunately, it's been a really rough year, particularly for Cameron, um, Louisiana, but certainly across the board. Um, there have been some relief efforts made. Um, Louisiana Sea Grant did at first feed the fleet in the Port of Lake Charles early on for that Western Louisiana community. Texas Sea Grant held a follow-up Feed the Fleet about two weeks ago, just prior to Delta hitting um, as a Feed the Fleet event. Um, both of those events helped bring together um, some funds to provide um, you know, food information on assistance and um, diesel fuel, which is one of the things they're being asked. We're being told is the biggest need in the area to keep generators running because they are as of before Delta, they were being told they wouldn't have power back in most of that area, at least until January. Um, I don't know yet at this point how much that timeline has been set back since Delta has occurred. Um, but there's a lot of needs. Those needs are ongoing. And um, we do plan to continue those events and continue to pro provide assistance to those communities. Um, some other highlights from the state programs for individual activities. Um, Texas has brought on an aquaculture specialist now to uh, help support the growing oyster mariculture industry here. His role, his name is Mario Marquez, and his role is specifically to work with um, parks and wildlife and interested investors on, you know, moving this, this industry forward as it gets started here in Texas. Um, and his first goal is in working on a one-stop shop for Texas on permitting processes for all the various agencies and, you know, education and information for farmers um, as they are entering into this new foray for us here in Texas. Um, Mississippi, Alabama has completed their final draft of a fisheries textbook, and I unfortunately did not write down the acronym in my head for what fisheries stand for right now. Apologies about that. Um, but this is a 10 chapter textbook on directed towards um, fisheries, science and ecosystem and environment in Mississippi. Um, it has now been peer reviewed and it will be coming out for publication and the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant team um, are planning to begin classes starting in 2021 to offer education for recreational community and anglers on fisheries and some of the fishery science and education in Mississippi with that textbook. Um, they also are um, prepared and ready to launch as the final piece of the Great Red Snapper count. Um, as I'm sure many of you have seen some of the results now that the congressional hearing took place last week for the Great Red Snapper count, Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant is in charge of some of the outreach and education on the results of that project and they have been waiting for finalization of some numbers. Um, and so they should, uh, in the near future, be coming out with some outreach and education around the final results of that project. Um, and their Bays and Bayous conference is coming up December 1 through 3, which will be occurring virtually. So uh, open attendance if anyone would like to join. Um, Florida Sea Grant has now reached their one year anniversary of their fishing guide certification program, which continues to grow and they've seen great recruitment in this past year. 
Um, and they have juggled their artificial reef summit multiple times this year. That is now occurring virtually as well. Um, and that will be held on November 4th for 6th. Um, and from Louisiana Cares, the, the Louisiana program has on top of you know, their COVID work and hurricanes has also been working with the department on the CARES Act. Louisiana does have their application open now and Louisiana Sea Grant has been trying to work collaboratively to um, assist in making sure that the industries are able to apply to that process. So that is the report from us at the moment. I'm happy to take any questions on any of those items if anyone has them. Great report, Laura. Any questions for Laura? No questions at all? So with that, it looks, it's kind of crazy to say this, but it look, I've been talking to Dave. It looks like we're going to go ahead and do lunch before we move on to items six and seven. Is that right, Dave? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're right at the lunch break. Um, so let, let's, let's take lunch and for an hour, we'll, be, we'll come back at uh, one o'clock on uh, uh, central time. Okay. All right. Meeting adjourned for lunch. Okay. I'll call the meeting back. Hey, Dave. Dave, oh, Doug Boyd, I'm on the call. Okay, great. I'll call the meeting back to order. Um, we left off, I believe with number uh, item six, uh, Roy? Yeah, can, can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. All right, so um, first thing I want to do is talk some about um, all the various goings on with uh, Red Snapper. Um, in particular, um, we heard a little bit about the great Red Snapper count um, coming out, and this is a a study that was funded by Congress, and uh, NIMPS developed the terms of reference for it and worked with Sea Grant team to design the survey methodology. And I think about 21 different scientists were involved in this, and we're just starting to see some of the results that are coming out of it, and I think it's gonna end up being a, an important study, but. They sampled around 1,500 sites using a whole suite of methods, um, basically habitat classification, visual accounts, acoustic surveys, tagging studies, etc. And the goal of this was to come up with a, an estimate of the absolute abundance of red snapper. And we've seen some of the preliminary results of it, which suggest that the population is almost three times larger than what, what has been estimated in recent assessments. And uh, it's interesting, over the years, the assessment's been criticized that it didn't count fish on, art, on artificial reefs. Well, it turns out that the assessment did a really good job of estimating the fish on high relief structure and artificial reefs. And so the problem is, is it really was only counting the fish that were on artificial reefs. And the problem is that the majority of the population is not on artificial reefs. It's on what they refer to as uncharacterized bottom. And I think they estimate that around 70% of the fish um, are on these actually these low relief bottom areas where there's very little fishing activities, so the assessment didn't really have any signals or any information um, about those fish. At any rate, I think this has a lot of implications for red snapper management, um, and my expectation at this point is that the data will go to the Southeast Fishery Science Center, and they will do an interim assessment that incorporates these results. And that will then go to the Gulf Council Scientific and Statistical Committee and come back to uh, the council. And that will provide advice for the SSC to essentially give the council a new catch level recommendation. And um, I think then the council's goal will be 
to implement the new catch levels um, in time for the 2021 um, fishing season. So we'll have to see what comes out of all this. And the other thing that's going on is there's been a lot of work done looking at the various state surveys and trying to develop conversion ratios that are able to ensure that the fish sampled by the state survey estimated is comparable to the catch level that's, that's allocated to that state. And the catch levels that come out of the current stock assessment and management is based on now are based on the old federal um, MRIP coastal house on telephone survey. And we know from looking at the state surveys that they're not directly comparable to the currency of the estimates used to set the catch limit. Some of the state surveys actually produce higher catch levels and some produce significantly lower catch levels. And so we need a way um, to establish a common currency to compare all this. And when we put in place the regulations implementing Amendment 50, which implemented the state management schemes, we laid out that we would make these conversions when the material and the information came available to do that. Um, so that's been done. There was a workshop convened, and it's been reviewed by the Council Scientific and Statistical Committee. And the Council at their last uh, meeting discussed this and discussed the great red snapper count and asked staff to develop a, um, an options paper, which the council will look at in um, October and then likely again in January. And it's the council's intent to implement um, the conversions in some fashion, and there are a lot of different ways to do that, at the same time that they implement the results of the uh, Great Red Snapper count and the new catch levels. So that's gonna be something that the council um, will be working on for the next few meetings. Then I wanted to give you just a quick update on aquaculture. Um, I believe probably everyone is aware that in August the courts ruled on the Gulf aquaculture and, uh, and basically this was an appeal and the appeals court um, confirmed the decision that NIMPS can't, it cannot regulate aquaculture as fishing under the Agnuson Act. So that's there, but that does not prohibit aquaculture from occurring in federal waters. It just means you don't need the permit, the NIMPS permit that was laid out in the Gulf Aquaculture Plan. So there are a couple of projects that are moving um, one is the Valella Epsilon a one cage pilot project, which will be located in federal waters off of Sarasota, Florida. And the EPA has issued uh, the permit for this project. So I expect that that was issued on September 30th. They still need to get the permits from the Army Corps, um, but I expect all that will happen over the course of the fall. Then there's also interest by Mana Fish Farms um, working with the University of Southern Mississippi. And they're looking at an area about 20 miles off of the coast of Pensacola um, to potentially put a fin fish um, pen raising project out there. So that one is uh, still in the going and I believe that's the from my office is going to give us a presentation on that um, this afternoon on, a, on the aquaculture developments. Um, as everyone knows, there have been a lot of hurricane activity over the last few years. And just to give you an update on where things stand with that, the funds for hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria have all been awarded. Funds for Hurricane Michael have been allocated, but not awarded yet, and they're waiting on the OMB to approve the Florida spin plan. Funds for the Bonacari um, disaster have been allocated but not awarded, and we're still waiting on getting all the spin plans worked up on that. 
and then a recent red tide. Um, this is based on the Florida in 2019 and Hurricane Laura in September of this year. Those disaster determination requests are currently in review. We're also looking at a request by uh, Louisiana for a temporary TED exemption for the portion of their coast that was affected by Hurricane Laura. And we're looking at that, but we were delayed in some of the work on that by Hurricane Delta. And so we will be looking at that to determine if a, a TED exemption is appropriate in Louisiana. And deal with that as quickly as you can. And that's my update, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Roy. So do you, on, the, on the hurricane updates, do, do you, you mention anything about Sally? No, I don't think we've gotten anything on Sally. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Roy? No questions? It's hard, to, it's hard to tell. Well, I appreciate your time, Roy, and, and look forward to hearing here in the next couple next couple of sections on the budget and stuff. So from there, I guess we'll move on to uh, to Glenn, and I think we also have um, Alan Brown for uh, Regional 4 office comments. Yeah, I, I don't know if Alan's on. Uh... Dan, he had, I think he got virtually hijacked into something else, but uh, he, he's, been on, he's been on all morning. And uh, so he, he didn't want me to pass on his apologies for not being able to, to stick it out. Um, and, and as usual, he just wanted to pass on appreciation to, uh, to the commission for helping with our small grants invasive species project. That's still a very popular um, uh, connection and partnership with our regional office is very efficient and James does a great job. Great projects get funded and, and uh, so so they really like that. I, I, I don't have a budget estimate on what that project that program is going to have this year. We're on continuing resolution so we'll probably have a better idea uh, at the spring meeting. Um, but uh, but yeah he, he wanted me to pass that pass that on to you guys and um, the only other thing I have is just kind of a heads up and I kind of wish this would have come up earlier uh, than yesterday afternoon because it would have been a good discussion point for the TCC meeting yesterday. Uh, but it has to do with uh, salt marsh top minnow. So the service is petitioned now to consider the top minnow for, for listing. And uh, I think ac across the Gulf, all the states um, have, have done some work since this petition came out in 2010, and we know a lot more now. And I know Paul Mickle has done a lot of work, and I've talked to Paul about the status of that species. But what's up next is a species status assessment, which is kind of the next step in the ESA process. Based on all the information we have, it's it's quite likely that if we put this in the, the population uh, data together, that we can avoid even going to that next uh, step. So. What's been successful with that in the past is that states uh, have presented this type of information in letters to the petitioners in the interest of short-circuiting this long formal administrative process that goes along with ESA. So just kind of a heads up, I might be reaching out to, uh, to you. I already have contacts in most of the states, I think. Our Panama City office is working with the folks in Florida. Um, but we'll be kind of helping to develop uh, what might be a letter of request from the states to the petitioners, kind of explaining the new information we have, <clears throat> which we're kind of packaging together now uh, in, in a request maybe to, to have them uh, remove the species from the listing process. So uh, if you know anyone from your offices or departments that might should be involved in that. If you wanted to shoot me an email, I'll add them to my contact list. Uh, and we're trying to work through this in the next month or so, um, so we can hopefully have one last species on the on the radar for for listing. So that's all I really have. Uh, again, Alan apologizes for not being here. 
I, w- I will say, Dave, I feel a little bit cheated, though. Normally, after a commission business meeting lunch, I, I feel a little more satisfied than the ham sandwich I had today for lunch. So. Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to make it up to you in March, but uh, we'll, I guess time will tell. Well, does anybody have any comments or discussions for Glenn? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, so, Glenn, the timing, you said you said in, in the next month or so, because I was thinking, well, maybe we could put it on the, the March agenda, uh, TCC agenda, but that would probably be uh, too late to, to the timing of that. Would, would well, well so uh, I'm not I'm not quite sure it'll be done by then. I'm hoping that if we can, uh, if we can, I know the state of Florida is already working on a letter and I've been talking to folks in Louisiana about it. Um, and what we're trying to do is is get ahead of um, the need to do a full-blown SSA. So if we're successful, yeah, the, the, the spring meeting won't be necessary. If it doesn't work, there may be some discussion uh, on how we can, uh, you know, support that next effort, the SSA, the species status assessment. So, yeah, hope, hopefully we won't we won't take it that far. And I'll, I'll keep you updated. Yeah, I'll, I'll have James put it put a note so uh, when March when we start developing an agenda, he'll touch base with you. And if there's a if there's a need, we can we can certainly get it on the. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks. Any other questions, discussions? You guys are quiet today. So, Dave, we're going to move on to uh, item number eight, which is the NOAA Fisheries Budget Update. And that's both you and Roy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, just a, a, a quick update on, on where we're at with the budget. Uh, uh, Tab C and D in your briefing book uh, the C is the kind of the the uh, the the, uh, uh, the overall bill, and then D is is kind of the report language that has the tables that that's a little more useful. So I'll 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 refer to your to y'all to uh, tab D. Um, the House did pass a pass a a bill for uh, for funding for 2020. 21 Senate has not yet done that, but uh, in the House, uh, they recommended uh, uh, 965 million for NOAA fisheries, uh, which is which is about 125 K million above the president's budget, which is good. Uh, fisheries data collection survey and assessments is is about 175 million, which is almost 10 million above the requested, and and uh, allocates uh, 24 million to to the fins, which is comparable to to uh, uh, um, uh, to, to funding last year, so so the increases that, that we saw this year will will continue into next year, which is a which is a, which is good. Um, and the, those that that particular I- line item funds uh, CMAP and 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 uh, uh, Gulf Fin and and our data collection programs. Aquaculture is at the, at about uh, 15 million. Uh, the regional councils and, and fishery commission line item uh, is at uh, uh, 46 and a half million, which is which is comparable to the, the funding from last year, uh, and it and it has language in there that it that it re- rejects the uh, the president's uh, um, recommendation of of reducing that reducing the funding, the proposed funding. Uh, um, as well as uh, the IGF grants is is right at uh, 3.4 million, which is which is similar to funding last year, and rejects the the proposed the proposed language for eliminating it. Um, enforcement is is up a little. Uh, it's above uh, 21 million from the president's budget at seven at uh, uh, which is translates to 77 million. And again, they they uh, there was language in there to um, eliminate the, the JEAs and they re- they uh, recommended uh, uh, or they rejected that that that, uh, that uh, proposed elimination and recommended that that the funding funding be uh, um, set at the F, the FY 2000 uh, excuse me FY 20 uh, funding level so 
Uh, overall, uh, that's uh, it's it's fairly good news for fisheries. Um, the and that and it's 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 even better because the house is is not necessarily as uh, uh, is not is not necessarily as as uh, supportive as as the Senate is. So if, if if we're getting some support in the house, that's that bodes well for when when the Senate comes out. So uh, I I think I think we should be uh, um, we should be okay for for next year. Um, uh, but as as Glenn Glenn uh, mentioned, we are on a continuing resolution, and and with the election and and everything, it'll it'll be interesting to see how how quickly a budget gets passed. But uh, um, and and the good news under the continuing resolutions, the 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 FY20 funding levels were were fairly uh, uh, beneficial to to uh, uh, to the the collection the data collection programs and aquaculture and enforcement and whatnot. So that's uh, uh, at least, at least we'll have uh, have some money. But uh, uh, I don't know if Roy has anything else to add. Uh, but uh, uh, if not, I will I will uh, take any questions. Any questions regarding the budget for Roy or, or Dave? No questions. So I guess we'll move on to item number nine, which is the presentation of aquaculture aspects of Executive Order 13921 with Jess Beck and Ken Riley. Welcome. You guys there? Hi, this is Ken Riley. Jess Beck is going to join us and lead off the presentation, and I'll take the second half of the presentation. Can you hear me, though, all right? Yes, sir. Sounds great. Thank you, sir. Great fine. Sorry, y'all. Um, can you hear me? On. Oh, okay. Yeah, yep. yeah, we can hear you. You can hear me. Oh, do you want me to call in through my phone instead, or does this work? It sounds pretty good. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Great. So I apologize in advance for any um, any noise you hear around the house. Um, so let's go ahead and and get started. Um, okay. So. I'll just be asking to advance the slides so I can work for my notes here. So um, thanks everyone. Um, this, I'm Jess Beck Stimpert, the Senior Aquaculture Coordinator for NOAA Fisheries in the Southeast region out here in St. Pete. Um, Ken Riley, you just heard from him. Um, Dr. Ken Riley with NOAA's Ocean Service. We will be tag teaming today's presentation. I'm gonna start off the first few slides and then hand it over to Ken. Um, we also have several other folks on the um, listening in. Um, Andrew Richard, who's a new coordinator, just newly hired in the region in May, and Christy Beard, who is also a new hire with the policy branch of the Office of Aquaculture out of um, Silver Spring. So between the four of us and Roy, uh, whatever questions you have at the end, we'll try our best to answer. And before I jump in, I just wanted to thank uh, you all at the commission for taking the time to discuss aquaculture on your agenda today. As many of you know, there was an EO published in early May of this year that focused on various actions related to marine aquaculture in the US. Um, that executive order has three main bins of activity. Uh, it deals with regulatory reform to remove unnecessary barriers to US commercial fisheries. It looks at trade aspects of seafood to ensure that US seafood has a level playing field in the global marketplace. And it also focuses on a suite of activities that expand sustainable aquaculture production. And that's the aspects which Ken and I will be talking about today. So that executive order 13921 uh, deals with uh, uh, capture fisheries, commercial fisheries, and um, also aquaculture, but we'll just be focusing on the aquaculture aspects of the EO today. Next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, a couple of things to note about the aquaculture provisions of the executive order. The section builds on activities and work that's been happening um, in regard to sustainable aquaculture development for years. And while NOAA plays a role in many of the actions outlined in the EO, it, this is truly an interagency effort, and we continue to work closely with other agencies like the Army Corps, EPA, and USDA to meet the goals outlined in the executive order. And there are several aspects, sections uh, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 that focus on aquaculture. Um, section seven is the section we really are gonna talk about today and that has to deal with aquaculture opportunity areas and that concept. So I'm just gonna briefly mention section six 
eight, nine, and 10, and then move on and spend the rest of the time, uh, Ken and I will, about uh, talking about section 10, or I'm sorry, section seven. So um, section seven in regards to aquaculture is about removing barriers to aquaculture permitting. It asks the Army Corps to evaluate nationwide permit programs for finfish, seaweed, and multi-species aquaculture, um, and to also augment the existing nationwide permit program for shellfish. Uh, there's proposed rule, um, package, I believe, I can't remember if we're still in the uh, comment period date or not, I haven't um, looked recently, and that data has escaped me, but there's a public comment period on that draft proposed rule, um, so that is something that the core is leading, that we are also going to be working with them on regional conditions in each, um, in its, each NIMPS region in the future. It also has known to be a lead agency for NEPA, as long as the project triggers the level of an environmental impact statement, so an EIS under NEPA, um, and meets several other requirements, such as the project must be in federal waters. Section 8, I'm skipping over Section 7, so I'll get into more detail about that over the next um, few slides. But Section 8, it's about good government and being transparent. This section asks NOAA to describe all the federal regulatory requirements to get an aquaculture permit and also outline state and federal agencies involved in the process. It outlines, it also asks us to outline the federal grant programs that are available for aquaculture and make sure all that information is online and up to date. Section nine of the executive order asks the federal agencies, oops, excuse me there. So asks the federal agencies with ties to aquaculture to evaluate whether or not Sorry, I'm losing my place here. Um, evaluate whether or not we should update the National Aquaculture Development Plan. Um, this is an existing plan from 1983 that came online following the 1980 Aquaculture Act. So aquaculture in the world of aquaculture has changed dramatically uh, over the past 30 and 40 years. So we anticipate working with other partner, partner agencies to develop a new plan and we'll um, provide more information whenever that is available. And finally, Section 10 of the executive order asks the USDA to evaluate whether or not they should update the 2008 National Aquatic Animal Health Plan. Um, 2008, we're over a decade uh, past that original plan, and USDA is currently working on drafting a new plan, which we expect to be public soon. Uh, so now I'm going to shift to Section 7 of the EO, which is um, focused on the aquaculture opportunity areas. I'll be calling them AOAs, um, and I'm sure Ken will also for the remainder of this presentation. Um, if you would like further information on the other sections of the EO, we would be happy to return and discuss those at a future meeting. So just let us know. Next slide, please. Okay. So jumping in. Um, Section 7 of the EO asks the Secretary of Commerce, in consultation with other um, federal officials and the Fishery Management Councils, and also in coordination with any state and tribal governments, uh, to identify at least two geographic areas um, in, within a year of the EO that are suitable for developing, suitable for commercial aquaculture development. Um, so our timeline on this for these two initial areas, which um, the Gulf of Mexico and uh, Southern California, federal waters off of both of those areas were chosen as the first two geographic areas that we begin to explore where aquaculture opportunity areas may exist in those waters. And that was done largely because of the interest and the work that was done siting wise and permitting wise so far um, in those two areas. So um, those seem like the uh, lowest hanging fruit at the time. Um, we, that process actually began as soon as the executive order dropped. So we're sort of on a compressed timeline uh, to get this done by next May. And Ken will be talking a little bit about the uh, timeline and the steps in the process that we're looking at from now until May of 2021. Then within two years of identifying each geographic area, which again would be uh, in this case in May of 2021, uh, we would begin the process of completing a PEIS, so a Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement, one for the Gulf of Mexico, looking at the area or areas that could be designated as AOAs, and the same for Southern California. And that PEIS would um, assess the impact of siting aquaculture facilities there. So that's, that's a, the normal NEPA process. Um, we would be uh, going through all of those steps that are required as part of, of NEPA. And for each of the following four years, we're also tasked with identifying two more geographic areas, completing the PEIS within two years. So beginning in, in uh, May or just before of every year, um, starting this 
past May in 2020 through 2025, we would be repeating this process. So we're going to have overlapping processes uh, over the next couple of years, because once we begin um, the first year of a um, AOA designation um, and then move into the PIS process, we will be, be beginning that process for another area and so on. So these will all begin to overlap and we'll keep our folks pretty busy. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the Southern California and Gulf of Mexico were selected as the first regions um, for a number of reasons there. I just want to mention, too, that the idea of uh, AOAs in state waters is a possibility in future years, as long as the state is open to development of AOAs in their state waters. Um, we've already had some interest by um, some uh, some folks in Florida, um, and this could perhaps repeat itself in other areas of the Gulf. So we could be back in the Gulf again, but looking at um, perhaps some state waters if the state is open to that and there is interest. Next slide, please. So I know that was a lot to digest so far um, the past few slides, uh, and I just want to point out some key takeaways regarding AOAs to try to make the concept as, as clear as possible. Then I'll, I'm going to let um, Ken take over after the next slide. An AOA is a discrete location or locations in the ocean that have been vetted through a process of data gathering, which is what is happening from um, this past May up until May of 2021. And Ken will talk more about that process. Uh, there's a lot of stakeholder input that goes into it. We've already gone to the Gulf Council to speak with them at their last meeting, and we are here now talking to you all. Uh, we also expect a request for information to be released in the coming weeks, which will ask the public for additional data that should be considered or other aspects that we should take into account as we look at um, areas within the Gulf of Mexico and federal waters, as well as federal waters off Southern California. So both um, uh, data holdings as well as uh, areas that we should or should not be considering. That request for information we expect to come out in the coming weeks and it'll have a generous comment period. Um, so we will uh, have some individual meetings with folks and then also have some um, regional national webinars so uh, we'll keep an eye out through the for those and make sure that you all are aware and distribute through the channels so we can get the information out for participation in both the public comment and the um, webinar uh, listening sessions um, as much as possible AOAs are not uh, going to be huge swaths of ocean rather we're talking about very small areas in the ocean uh, we anticipate that in the Gulf of Mexico and in Southern California separately, um, the size of the AOA or AOAs um, that would be identified would support three to five mm -hmm. aquaculture operations. And these aquaculture operations um, could encompass uh, finfish, shellfish, macroalgae, or a combination of species. The EO is, is um, inclusive of all the various species that could be uh, cultured, so we're not just talking about one or the other. Um, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to mention here. Oh, I also should say that the federal and state um, permitting and authorization requirements are the same um, within AOAs as anywhere else. So AOAs are basically a planning um, concept. They're, they're to gather data, to gather public input that um, would point us to areas that may be more suitable for aquaculture development. It does not negate um, any of the permitting or authorization processes that would have to occur. Folks would still have to get their core permit um, for anchoring um, uh, the, the Section 10 permit under Rivers and Harbors Act. Um, they would still have to get an EPA permit, the NPDES discharge permit, if they were uh, working with the species, were there any inputs or discharges? Um, and they would also have to go through any other authorization processes um, as they would just with any other um, project that would want to go outside of AOAs. So it does not shortcut that permitting process at all. It simply provides um, some uh, forward thinking and some uh, proactive steps in terms of looking at areas that may or that may be suitable for aquaculture. Um, so that basically um, is a a plus in the category for the commercial folks that allows them to build off of the knowledge that's gained off of certain areas rather than having to go out and do that themselves. I uh, also want to just say here too that the consultation processes, of course, through NOAA Fisheries would also remain the same. And next slide. Okay, so the process of identifying AOAs, there's 
there's a lot involved here. Um, as I mentioned, we've talked to the council, we're talking to you folks, we anticipate coming back in future meetings to give you all updates and also to get feedback from your group. Um, and in essence, we're going to be utilizing uh, citing analysis and result, citing analysis results and mapping tools. And Ken will be talking about that. That's an NCOS, um, part of the NOS side of the house for this, for this um, directive. Stakeholder input from you all, um, as well as the public. There's a lot of interagency coordination that's happening both at the national and the regional levels. We have a really um, good regulatory task force here in the Gulf that we've been working with for about seven or eight years now. So we have folks across all of the various federal agencies that are involved in any type of permitting or authorization processes in the Gulf, including those in the Department of Defense. Um, as I mentioned, there will be a request for information that will publish in the Federal Register in the coming weeks, and we'll make sure to get that information out to you all. There will be some very specific questions in that Federal Register notice um, that will ask about uh, specific things that should be taken into account that we know are of importance in both our region as well as nationally. So um, in addition, that request for information, uh, we'll be asking for information not only about where we should and should not be looking at in the Gulf and California for this first round, but also we need to start that second round to those next two areas um, that's directed, uh, that is directed by the EO. Uh, we need to start that this spring so we can meet the target um, over the five-year time period laid out. And so we need to get some information from the public about where else we should be looking. Should we perhaps be looking in other regions? Should we be looking at state water somewhere? So there will also be questions directed um, at those aspects. And I just want to um, say we have uh, say also that this last bullet says we'll update and collaborate with the councils throughout the process. That should say councils and commissions. So that's an oversight of ours. We'll, we'll fix that. But um, we definitely would like to get your feedback and your collaboration as we work our way through this multi-year process. And now I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Ken Riley um, with NOAA's National Ocean Service. Um, and if you wanna go ahead and advance to the next slide, Ken will go ahead and take over. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. Um, my name is Ken, is Ken Riley, and I, I'm leading the project team that's doing the spatial analysis and a lot of the siting work and environmental modeling that will be occurring in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, for the remainder of the presentation, I'll just dive into what is an aquaculture opportunity area and talk through some of our processes. So an aquaculture opportunity area is a defined geographic area that's been evaluated for its potential suitability for commercial aquaculture. We're using a combination of scientific analysis and public engagement to identify areas that are best suited for aquaculture with regards to the environment, the economics, and those coastal communities where they're situated. As Jess mentioned, these areas would be able to support multiple aquaculture operations a few farms, say three or five farms, in a variety of different production formats, including algae and seaweeds, molluscan and bivalve shellfish, and finfish operations. Aquaculture opportunity areas would not exclude any ocean use. This is a planning exercise, and it's very important to note that we're continuously working to minimize potential user conflict. Next slide. With this slide, I'd like to review some of the um, happenings and plans for engagement over the next year. We're working at a really fast, feverish pace on early public and stakeholder outreach um, to introduce this AOA concept and describe our site analysis. Today's meeting is just an example of that. Soon, our request for information will be published in the Federal Register, which will request public input on AOAs in the Gulf of Mexico and Southern California. And it's also going to ask for information on how NOAA should think about AOAs in the out years, in future years. We really want to stay engaged with the commissions and the councils and our stakeholders and federal and state agencies from the, from the beginning through the entire process. We would like to have an invitation and, and participate at your meetings as often as possible. And I know you only meet a couple times a year, but um, if higher engagement is required, we're here to make sure that everybody stays informed. We'll publish the, an aquaculture opportunity atlas in May of 2021. This atlas will highlight potential areas to be considered through the programmatic environmental impact statement. The PEIS will be developed over the next two years, and after that, a formal aquaculture opportunity area will be identified. So for the, if you go to the next slide, for the 
remainder of the presentation, I'd just simply like to introduce you to our aquaculture team with the National Ocean Service and review our research plans supporting the executive order. Our program is situated in the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, or NCOS. We lead the nation on aquaculture planning, siting, and environmental research. We've been building this program for over a decade. We work in every coastal state, helping coastal managers make informed decisions about aquaculture. For aquaculture to continue to grow in the coastal landscape, it's very important that we use the best available science in decision making. Our team works every day on front lines with federal agencies, including the Army Corps, EPA, NOAA Fisheries, and the Department of Defense. We work and have similar established relationships with state agencies too. We work with many of you all that are participating in this meeting. Our scientists include a blended workforce of ecologists, oceanographers, modelers, engineers, and geospatial scientists. Many of our staff have practical experience working in the aquaculture industry. We've hired many of them from um, commercial farms that are established across the country, whether it's shellfish or finfish or, or all the different types of operations. So we've really tried to build a robust team with lots of experience. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, our research capitalizes on the need to support smart planning and siting for the growing aquaculture industry. This means planning for aquaculture at regional and landscape scales, such as the work with the aquaculture opportunity analysis. Um, we will work on precision siting. Um, we work on precision siting for individual operations, and most of our work is at the request of a federal action agency, such as the Army Corps. The Corps will come to us and ask for us to work with an applicant to help that applicant find the right location for establishing their business. We also support a large environmental research portfolio that includes farm production modeling, effluent modeling, and studies on the interactions of fisheries and protected resources. With all our research, we're constantly thinking about how to make our science widely available. This leads to our work to develop tools. Next slide. Here's just a sample of the tools and technology that our program has developed in recent years. For example, our aquaculture data catalog has over 33 million data layer layers where we can use the power of GIS to inform spatial planning and precision siting. It's some of the largest geospatial data holdings in all of NOAA. Ocean Reports is a tool that was, uh, that was published last year. It was a premier automated spatial planning tool that we developed in partnership with BOEM. Um, I encourage you to check out Ocean Reports. It's really easy to find if you just Google Ocean Reports. Just imagine being able to use a tool where you can draw a box or a shape of any size in the, in the coastal ocean, out in the ocean, and, and you will be, get information back on, on um, you get automated spatial planning information and infographics and descriptions of that ocean space that you've drawn your box in. So check it out. Next slide, please. This slide shows the study areas that will be the starting point for the site analysis. The area was informed by analyzing where industry is currently pursuing researching and commercial endeavors. The study area is in federal waters with depths of 50 to 150 meters. Because the Gulf is so large, we broke up the region into smaller study areas defined by their similar ecology and oceanography. We use the Gulf ecoregions to define the study area boundaries. You'll note that this is just our starting point. We haven't taken out any areas for marine sanctuaries, marine protected areas, oil and gas industries, or military activities. So this is just the starting point for our research. Next slide. This diagram demonstrates our workflow for the research that will be completed over the next year. We'll start with the project requirements. This is the information that the aquaculture industry uses in selecting suitable sites. This might include things like water temperature, wave climate, ocean currents, and soils and sediments. We then lay a grid over our area of interest and inventory the data available for developing a suitability model. This is a lot like doing habitat suitability models for fishery species. Next, we'll build a suitability model to assess the compatibility, suitability, and opportunity for aquaculture development across the study area. Finally, we'll use a statistical approach called cluster analysis to begin to identify potential aquaculture opportunity areas. Let me take you through some visuals for this process. We go to the next slide. Here's a sample of the study area with its bathymetric profile. Depth is very important consideration for aquaculture development. 
to the right is a gridded overlay. We use a hexagon grid cell because it responds well to high resolution data and our models. We'll use a 10 acre grid cell um, size for the Gulf of Mexico. This means that each of those grid cells will receive a suitability score from our model. Next slide. Um, next, we compile data from across a variety of categories, military, navigation, industry, oceanography, biology, and boundaries. We have reviewed and vetted this data with federal and state agencies and so many stakeholders. This process has been going on for the past four or five months, and it is an ongoing process. Next slide, please. Next, we build the suitability model using and scoring the data. This becomes quite a complex model. Here's an example of the scoring criteria on the left. You'll note the suitability scores range from zero, an area is not suitable, to one, it's potentially compatible and or presents opportunity for aquaculture. On the right is a sample map for modeling off California. Here you see how aquaculture would not be suitable with su submarine cables or oil and gas infrastructure. You can also see our consideration of fisheries interactions. Like the Gulf of Mexico, there's a lot of fishing activity off of California. Next slide, please. Our last step is to use spatial statistics to identify potential sites. We use cluster analysis to look for clusters of the highest scoring grid cells. For the aquaculture opportunity areas, we'll look for clusters of grid cells with the highest scores totaling 500 to 1,000 hectares. That's around three square miles. We hope to identify about 10 potential aquaculture opportunity areas across the entire region. We may find some study areas may not support aquaculture opportunity areas at all. Next slide, and last slide. We'll publish our findings in the Atlas of Potential Aquaculture Opportunity Areas. We aim to have a draft complete in late winter for review and publication in the spring. So that concludes our presentation. If we can go to the final slide, Jess and I'll be happy to take any questions as time allows. Thank you. So Jess, I'll turn it back over to you um, or, or others. And uh, if you have any questions. How many, does anybody have any questions or discussions? Well, that's a great presentation. I do have a couple questions uh, regarding the Sarasota one and how far offshore and what species they're they're talking about. Sure, that's, that sounds great. Um, so I, I'll, Jess, I'll start and then please fill in the, the gaps if you like. So our team um, has been doing all the site analysis for all the commercial farms around the country. And for the Valella project, which is um, operated by Ocean Era Incorporated, um, the site's located about 42 miles offshore, and um, their requirement was that we find a site that um, would be suitable for an anchorage or mooring, meaning that it has um, sandy bottoms, and uh, and they're going to raise Almaco Jack. And they're working with the University of Miami and Moat Marine Laboratory and maybe some others in acquiring local um, stocks to stock that experimental cage. So on the one, the one that Roy mentioned in the panhandle, I think that's still being talked about, that's 20 miles off. Were, were they talking about raising cobia? So, so the, go ahead, oh, Jess. Sorry. Please. No. <laughs> sorry, I was just going to chime in here. Sorry, I didn't hear the, the I didn't hear about the, the first part for Valella Epsilon, the question, but I can chime in here on MANA. So the MANA fish farms, they're still, um, they're still um, gearing up to do a, a second survey um of an area they had to expand their area a little bit they ran into some uh, hard bottom areas um so they're uh gearing up to hopefully do a survey sometime that at coming months um the mana fish farms folks are working with um uh the tag cochran center at usm and, and kelly lucas and her group uh they're the science partners on that so um kelly's been looking 
various quotes and, and things for the uh, survey. There's There were things lined up and then COVID hit, so a lot of surveys um, across fisheries and everywhere else got backed up or canceled because of that. So um, they actually, um, they aren't even at the uh, permit application stage. That may be something that happens um, sometime in 2021, and, and Kelly can give a better idea of that um, whenever she knows more about the project and the survey aspects. Um, I, it, they have talked about Red Drum. I don't know about Cobia. That's a little north in the Gulf, so I don't know if that's a conducive area for Cobia. Uh, so she would be the best person to ask about that, but until we have more certainty about the actual site um, and the project itself and the actual um, information for permit applications, I, I don't know that they can tell you for sure exactly what species beyond the interest in Red Drum um, until that point. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. I think the other the other thing that it would be interesting for me to to understand is how this would work in state waters, with all the boat traffic and everything, and the conflict of interest and all that. So that's going to be an interesting discussion when y'all start having those. Sure. So I'll, I'll just add so that um, that's an, a key component of all the site analysis is to do the vessel traffic assessment. And we have um, feeds of both land-based and satellite-based AIS that we use in that um, and other information that we use on vessel traffic. But you're absolutely right. A key part of permitting, especially with the Army Corps, is completing a traffic assessment. Does anybody have else have any questions? Well, I appreciate you guys coming and giving this presentation. It's very interesting. Um, Dave, with that, I guess we'll move on to item 10. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you there? Item 10 was, was it was something that it, it was suggested that, that we look at doing one meeting a year. Um, and there's obviously pros and cons to it. Uh, it kind of it came, came back to a head because of the situation we're in with, with COVID and, and looking at different technologies to hold, for holding meetings and whatnot. Um, I, I just, and I, I just kind of want to open the floor uh, to hear thoughts from, from, from the commissioners. Um, but before, uh, before I do that, my, my one major concern about, about moving to just one meeting a year is it, it, it minimizes our, um, our face-to-face -face interactions. And I think that's, uh, I think that's been, that's become readily apparent, the importance of that, uh, having do, having done all these, uh, uh, all these meetings, uh, virtually that, that not having that, uh, that face-to-face -face, uh, interaction is is uh, um, is essential. But ha having said that, I just you know, I, I Dan, I know I know you and I have talked about this. Do you want to um, make a few comments, and then we can we can hear what the what other 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 folks uh, um, think and and their thoughts. Yeah, I think I'm the one that brought this up, actually. I was just thinking that it would have been easier for us to save some money and do some different things. I mean, now we can do stuff virtually, whether it's the subcommittees meeting virtually or whatever, and just moving it to one big meeting in, in the, either the fall or the spring. And that's that's just something I've been thinking about. It just seems like an awful lot to have something in March and then something in October. And we really don't cover much of anything that we have already covered previously. So I, that's just my theory. I don't know if anybody else has any comments. Yeah, this is Reed. Um, yeah, I agree on some level. Um, I certainly would not want to get rid of face-to-face -face meetings altogether, and I don't think that's the recommendation here. Um, uh, the face-to-face, -face, uh, the breaks, uh, uh, lunches and dinners, certainly, I think a lot gets accomplished yeah, there. One or two. Um, but I, 
the flip side is virtually is logistically a whole lot easier, but it's also easier. I think we'll all agree to, to get sidetracked if you're sitting in your office or at home. Um, so uh, the level of attention goes down a little bit, um, but I'm certainly open to looking at options and, and seeing what may be available. I mean, Dave, I mean, Dave, what are, what are you thinking? I mean, are you, you wanting to stay a course and do the two meetings or you want to try something different? Well, um, I, I will say that the, the Pacific Commission does, they have one annual meeting um, in, in uh, a year. Uh, the Atlantic Commission obviously doesn't, but but they're more geared towards a council type of of uh, of of protocol just because just because they have management authority and, and the Pacific and the Gulf do not. So I, I don't and and the my, I, I've thought someone someone is uh unmuted. Uh, uh, and and I thought you know I've I thought a little bit about it after after we talked and um, if we did go to one meeting a year I I think I think keeping the the October meeting works better um, because we, we make some decisions about funding uh, funding priorities and funding activities um, where in March we we're, we're still early in the year and and uh, uh, and uh, and wouldn't and couldn't really couldn't really do that. Um, uh, if if we did if we did go to one, uh, I would suggest that that we expand the travel reimbursement to uh, to for the subcommittees and committee uh, members, um, as well as as well as the commissioners. Right right now we are because of because of the 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 funding that we ha that we're receiving for the various. <clears throat> projects and whatnot. We fund all our committees and subcommittees to attend, um, and and I would I would suggest that that we start we start covering travel for the legislative appointee and private citizen as well, um, and and expand expand their authorization so they're not just coming in for. Uh, uh, you know, they come in the night before meet and then and then leave the next day. But have them have them come in so they're able to attend the general session and have and 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 be able to interact interact more. We're, we're still, you know, we, we've uh, we've um, uh, we've we've minimized the 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 meeting or reduced the meeting to three days and and you know having. Having both the committee members and subcommittee members just come in for for one meeting, uh, I think is it, it, it's we're not we're not getting the bang for the buck. So if we would expand expand that the travel authorization and have them come in come in a day before and 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 and, and spend more time at the commission, one it, it allows for more uh, uh, more attendance. It allows for more interaction with people. Um, it allows more people to attend the general session as well as the, the Lyle Simpson award ceremony. Um, and, and then uh, on on Wednesday night, instead of just having having a uh, having a reception, we could actually have a full sit down dinner similar to like we do with the luncheon uh, earlier in the day. Um, but because be, only having one meeting, we would reduce the cost and be able to be able to do that. So th those are just some of my thoughts. Um, I'm not. I'm not adverse to it. Uh, it. It. It would take some. We would have to do some adjustments in the way the way things we are operate. We operate now, but it's not. It's not something that's. Uh, uh, that's not. That's not doable. Um, the having said all that, the only the 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 only thing about it is, if we did it, we wouldn't be able. We really would be able to do it till. Till 2022, anyways, because 21 we need to have the March meeting because we postponed the uh, postponed our uh, um, our Lyle Simpson Award ceremonies because we didn't want to do that virtually. So 
So if we did it, it would we'd have a we'd have a year to to kind of think about it and work and and uh, um, uh, you know I, the the more I think about it, I, I think that I think that it's uh, it's it's not it's not something that's uh, uh, um, a bad idea to look at. And, and if we do it for a year and and decide, hey, this is not just not working out. There's nothing to say we can't go back. We can't go back the next year to 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 the meeting in March and in October. It's not. It's nothing that's uh, that's uh, undoable. But so. So Dave, you you answered some of my question there. But if if we went to just one meeting and kept travel as it is, not saying that that's what I'm suggesting. What would be the cost savings? And aside from expanding travel for the one in-person meeting, what would be some alternate uses for that funding? Well, I'm I'm not sure. We haven't really looked at at the actual cost savings because the there's the subcommittee the subcommittees may still there's there's still a requirement at least at least for uh, like golf in for that they have to meet more than once a year and um, some of these other committees I think would need to meet would still need to meet uh, and potentially we could do it face to face potentially uh, potentially do it virtually um, so I you know I'm not sure exactly how much, uh, how much, uh, how much savings we would travel, travel savings we would have, um, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to go through that exercise until, until we talked about it here as the commission, um, but that's certainly an exercise that we could, uh, uh, that that we could go, uh, uh, we could, we could uh, um, conduct, um, and and see what, see what would see what it would uh, save the the thing about it is <clears throat> it would save us some money but it, i i don't think it's it's not like it's going to save us a hundred thousand dollars it's you know it's we're probably looking at on the order of of uh of 10 20 maybe 30k so so it's but i mean it's, that it's not going to be a huge amount yeah so is that something since we wouldn't be able to implement this to 2022 anyway Something that uh, you and your staff could put together for the March meeting for, for us to take a look at with different scenarios. Um, yep. You know, the dry run, and obviously the first one's not going to be as sufficient as subsequent meetings. But uh, you know, look at based on what what we did with this meeting, what we think can work virtually. Um, you know, either not for both, but for for one of the meetings, whether you know subcommittees and, and full commission. And just look at some options and ballpark estimates, the cost savings, and how that could be reallocated. That that would be informative to me. Yeah, we could certainly do that. Yeah, um, Dan and and Dave, you know, I think we we all have talked about this a little bit before, and so I guess I want to uh, piggyback on on Reed's comments. As I, I had a very similar thought, was that uh, maybe you poll your committee chairs and you know kind of get their feedback on. On what they think, and then um, you know, do a quick cost analysis of a of a once a year meeting, and then expanding to and, and I guess maybe look at it from a, a tiered look. Like if you expanded the travel, what would that look like? Uh, uh, I I definitely uh, like at least you know that once a year get together. Again, there's there's a lot to be said for an in person, and the awards thing you know is definitely an in person type thing. So, uh, uh, but I. But I know everybody's schedules and, and it's challenging to uh, to sometimes travel as many weeks out of the year as, as some of us do. But um, so I'm, I could go either way, but I, I think it's definitely worth looking into the uh, the option. And I think we do have a little time because uh, I was it was actually going through my head when you mentioned earlier. I said, I don't think we try and do this for next year because right. uh, I think there's too many unanswered questions. So I think we have a little time. So I don't even know. Do we do we need any kind of motion or anything from this meeting other than maybe asking your staff to do an analysis but i mean i think you can do that without a motion and then we just uh leave this on the agenda uh mr chair yeah that's what i was thinking i don't think we need a motion i think that we're just asking staff to, to put some pros and cons together yeah i and i think yeah i i i would agree i don't know that there's a need for a motion but just uh 
just to have uh, uh, direct staff to do that. And we can certainly do it and put it on the agenda for March. <clears throat> any other any other discussion on that topic? So I guess we're going to move on to item 11, which are the the Gulf States program reports. And I'll start with Steve Vanderkoy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Well, um, in the briefing book, I'll direct you to tab E. Uh, I provided a short overview there of sort of what's been going on. And obviously the, the theme so far of most of our meeting has been COVID, 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 and that seems to be the case here. Um, a red drum profile where we've had a lot of other things that were more important over the last several months. So that's sort of been a back burner item. We're getting back into the swing of things. Um, we're going to have a conference call in another couple of weeks and, and, and try to kind of hit the reboot button on that. Obviously, the mangrove snapper profile has been on hold since we haven't made a lot of progress on red drum. I am happy to report because of COVID, we had a lot of time to review and edit and, and finish up the formatting on the Odleth manual revision. So the third edition will be coming out uh, available on our website probably by November, uh, publication number 300 for the commission. Uh, it's been six years in the process. Atlantic States and the Gulf Commission combined working on it, close to 50 contributors. Um, it's been a huge task and it's kind of been a burden, uh, but not a financial one. We've been working opportunistically and we're happy to have it done. Um, there's several other things identified in that. Uh, the one that I'm going to go to now is the is just a quick summary of the, the small grants program. Joe, if you could bring that slide up. Uh, as you heard in the other reports, um, we had a com combined total of about 1.4 million for the coming year that we split between the five agencies. Um, this table kind of summarizes what everybody is doing. Uh, there's work on blue crabs, scallops, oysters, flounder, and then there's also, you know, just the general uh, commercial survey work uh, in Florida. Uh, Mississippi is is developing a, a more uh, unified database for the fishery independent data. Texas is looking at doing some additional monitoring using environmental DNA. Um, flounder obviously is a big uh, species of interest right now for most of the states. As you can see, four of the five have it on their uh, work plan. Uh, there's three states doing acoustics work. That'll be uh, uh, acoustic tagging and uh, expansion of receiver arrays. Um, so I think that's going to become a, a, a really helpful pro program for, for you guys. Um, and in the future, I'm hoping that we can begin to coordinate a little bit. Uh, if, if something like the flounder work is uh, valuable to all, it may be something that we kind of uh, begin to cooperate a little bit more a little more communication, and it may be something that we can leverage each other's work to, to get a little more out of it. Um, other than that, uh, it was noted earlier, we do have our funding for next year, um, which will be for projects in 2022. Uh, we're looking at about 180K per state. Um, obviously, the, the larger amount that's going right now is a two-year lump. Um, now we're down to a single year, and and so we're we're hoping that we continue uh, at least level funding to where we can have about 900k annually to be able to put into uh, research projects. So that's all I've got at this time. If if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Try to. Any questions for Steve? Kind of hard to see. No questions. All right, Steve, you want to move on to the aquaculture program? I certainly will. So not a lot to update. Um, again, COVID has been sort of the uh, operating word 
for, for the last six or seven months, and it's delayed several of the projects. We did do a query to all of our pilot uh, PIs, and out of 10 projects, only three really have some budgetary issues related to carrying costs or cancellation of, of contracts. So the rest are delayed but are continuing. Most everyone has requested and received extensions. So we have funding available for the coming year for an RFP for pilots, but considering how many projects we have outstanding and no one is able to really continue work, uh, the Gulf Commission has elected to wait one more year and we will have a much larger RFP go out in next next fall for the 2022 uh, funding year. And so instead of about 600,000, uh, we'll probably have somewhere around 900 to uh, a million uh, available in an RFP for pilot work. That'll also free up some of the people who are PIs now to be uh, competitive once again. Um, the only other thing that I've got is, uh, Joe, if you could bring up the website. We did finally develop a, uh, a page for the commission um, for our aquaculture program. We've, we've summarized. Uh, the individual programs. Uh, we have the off bottom, which we started with. We've got pilots now. We also have the uh, oyster consortium. Those are small pages. And the mapping is, is kind of new. Joe Ferrer here in our office has become quite the web designer. If you click on that, Joe, you can kind of show them the, what it does is it actually pinpoints, uh, locates all of the projects that we've had to date. Uh, they're identified by year and whether they're uh, currently uh, ongoing or if they've been completed. It gives you a summary uh, when you click on one of those. Can you do the one, the blue one at the mouth of the river there on the map? Yep. It brings a little pop-up. And in addition to that, if there's a final report or one of our YouTube presentations from our general sessions. Those are made available so the uh, viewer can actually see what the project was and get the information, the results. Um, we're going to continue to update this uh, as sort of a living uh, map and, and database of all the projects we've done to date. Um, Joe did a lot of work on that and, and it took a little bit of uh, creative programming to get this thing to work, but it's it's pretty slick. So if you get a chance, go to our website and check out our new page. Um, I think that's all I've got for aquaculture. If there's any questions, I'll, I'll entertain them. Any questions for Steve? Looks like there's not any questions, Steve. So we'll move on to Jeff and Sima. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, everyone was already briefed on uh, some CMAP activities in Darren's TCC report and the CMAP budget in Scott's state federal report. Uh, the spring plankton survey, which normally place, takes place during April and May, was canceled this year. The majority of the bottom online survey was also canceled this year. Um, Alabama was able to get out and complete all of their stations during the spring, summer, and fall time period. Um, but the others were affected by uh, COVID-19 restrictions on their staff and going out on the boats. Uh, the CMAP vertical line survey was scheduled to sample about 218 stations off Texas, Louisiana, and Alabama. Um, the number of stations actually sampled in much less than this. Approximately 70 stations have been sampled so far from April through October, with Alabama again being able to complete all their stations. Apparently, they don't have uh, COVID very bad in South Alabama. Uh, the CMAP reef fish survey was completed this summer with a reduced sampling effort. Uh, a new reef fish survey design was supposed to be implemented with supplemental funding from uh, a NOAA Restore Act Science Program grant. Uh, NOAA fisheries did not uh, conduct any sampling this year, but Florida was able to get out and uh, sample approximately 1,000 stations 
in the Eastern Gulf, the summer shrimp, the groundfish survey uh, was, was supposed to start in June, but because NOAA Fisheries would not have been able to participate during June or July this year, the subcommittee decided to only sample the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. Um, so we, we had planned to sample 150 stations in July, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, at the last minute, uh, the entire survey was canceled due to one crew limitation for Mississippi, and that kind of had a domino effect of Mississippi and Alabama couldn't go out together. So really wasn't the point of the, uh, the Louisiana or Florida going out because we wouldn't have a full survey. Uh, the fall plankton survey was also canceled due to COVID. The fall shrimp groundfish survey started October 1st, and everyone is going to participate in this survey and to now hope to complete about 300 stations between now and mid November as part of this survey. Uh, CMAP has been working to improve the identification of invertebrates captured during sampling activities. Uh, we have held several invertebrate identification workshops online over this past summer to help field staff in the identification of echinoderms. And the workshops are part of a larger effort to hold a face-to-face -face meeting next year to provide a more hands-on approach to help in the identification of invertebrates here in the Gulf of Mexico. The Commission continues to manage CMAP data and distribute the data to interested parties. The Commission has fulfilled four CMAP data requests since March and the various CMAP databases have been downloaded 64 times since March. And that concludes my report. Thank you, sir. Anybody have any questions on CMAP? No questions? All right, Jeff, what about CARES Act? All right, I've got a little presentation here. Um, so I'm uh, going to give a, a presentation on the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act. Um, this was passed on May 7th of, of this year. Um, the Secretary of Commerce announced that there would be $300 million available for fisheries assistance. Uh, Due to COVID-19, uh, these would be available to different fishery participants. These participants included tribes, persons, fishing communities, aquaculture businesses, processors, or other fishery-related businesses who incurred a loss as a direct or indirect result of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, fisheries, fisheries participants were eligible if they incurred an economic loss greater than 35% as compared to the previous five-year average revenue or any negative impacts to subsistence, cultural, or ceremonial fisheries. Um, and NOAA Fisheries is using the three commissions to distribute these funds. So here in the Gulf, Texas received about $9.2 million dollars. Louisiana 14.7, Mississippi 1.5, Alabama about 3.3, and Florida about 23.6 million. Uh, Florida decided not to split their coast, and they are working with the Atlantic State Green Fisheries Commission and not us here uh, at Gulf States. So we have been working over the summer with each state to develop spend plans that were consistent with the CARES Act and also NOAA guidance. Uh, We've been sending those in to NOAA for uh, um, them to edit and, and look at to make sure that they are compliant. We've been able to, so far, uh, get three of those passed. But all spend plans must describe the main categories for funding, um, how they plan to spend the funds, and how they plan to uh, distribute those out to the various entities that were impacted by COVID. Uh, one thing to note uh, that that's for repair businesses, restaurants, or seafood retailers are not considered fish related businesses for this purpose of the, of the CARES Act. There were other funds available through other uh, agencies like the U.S. Department of Agriculture for some of these other impacts. Okay. All eligible fishery participants will be 
required by the states to uh, self-certify that they are eligible or to use uh, things like trip tickets to, uh, I guess, provide justification for their impact. Uh, they then have to show that their losses were greater than 35% from the 2015 through 2019 average. And they must attest that they have not received other COVID related assistance and the sum of all assistance when combined with their reduced revenue does not exceed the level of their five year average. And basically what that means is they can't make themselves more than whole. So if you had $50,000 worth of impact, you can't apply for $25,000 of, of CARES Act funds or receive $25,000 of CARES Act funds and then apply for $30,000 or receive $30,000 from somewhere else. That would make you more than whole, and that's what they don't want you to do. So, uh, in Louisiana, their spend plan was approved on August 4th of this year. The application process started on September 14th and will close on October 26th. Uh, we are hopefully in the next few days going to be receiving the first round of applicant applications so we can start uh, processing those and writing checks and getting those out to affected participants. Uh, the Alabama spin plan was approved on September 3rd. Their application process started on September 14th also and will close on October 30th. Mississippi had their spin plan approved earlier this week and their application process will start in the near future. Texas has been working with their governor's office to get their approval on their draft spin plan so we can send it up to NOAA to have them review it. And that concludes my report and we have to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Jeff? Thank you. I do that. Go ahead. Um, this is Scott. Um, you know, we're with the uh, the hurricanes. Um, you know, Alabama is considering um, the possibility for for an extension on the deadlines. You know, people are. Uh, focused on disaster recovery and and uh, you know we were actually both of our offices were actually closed for uh, a week because we were without power and and, and different things and uh, and I, I'm not trying to speak for Louisiana but potentially they may be in the same boat with having two hurricanes come through there um, what is the would that be a request that just goes to you guys does that have to go to NOAA No, it, it's one of those things, Scott, where y'all can have the application process open as, as long as you want to. Um, the only thing is, we do have that deadline of September of next year. We need to be able, we need to have spent all the funds and gotten them out. So whatever you feel is necessary to provide for your participants to, to get their applications in, uh, if you wanted to extend that for another two weeks or another month, that's fine. Uh, just remember, though, that we have to have everything uh, in from them and then out the door from us by uh, September of next year. Okay, thank you. I did have a, I do have a question, and I don't want to get into too much in the weeds. So, an issue came up the other day, and I don't know how you guys are handling this. So, the residents residency requirements. So, we have fishermen that are fishing in Alaska and Maine. That don't land in Florida, but yet they are told that they need to come to Florida to apply. Do any of you guys have any of those issues like that? It, it was my understanding when we, when we had the initial discussions that with NOAA, and it got a little bit confusing when NOAA made a presentation at the council meeting yep. that if a person was in a state uh, that they apply for the, the, their their state of residency. So, you know, we do have a couple that would be residents of Alabama, but they fish in like Louisiana, but Louisiana was an eligible state. So for, for CARES Act, um, the impact. And so that was my understanding was they were in a CARES Act eligible state. They still file in their state of residency, even though they fished in another state. It, that and that was my understanding too, Dan. And and, and Scott was right because init, on the initial calls they said, you know, you file in the state of your residency, and then I think I don't remember who gave the presentation to the council that said something different, and it was like, well, wait a second. And, but yeah, I, it, it's this, and, and then we got clear. We had, on subsequent calls we got clarification. They said no in your state of 
file in the state of res residency. So those guys would need to file in Alaska or New Jersey or wherever the heck they are. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. So if they file in their state of residency, they're going to file here, but I'm not going to have oh, any oh. way. I'm not going to have any oh. way to, to figure out who those guys are because I don't have any record of them as being fishermen in Florida. Oh, I don't, yeah. Yeah, and Alabama's plan, we actually, you know, we still ask for them to provide documentation of participant in the in the eligible fisheries. Um, so again, we we've actually had uh, Dan, a, a Florida resident who who fishes in Alabama, but we told them they actually need to file in Florida. So I have probably pushed one to you, but uh, but but yeah, we're we're still trying to apply the same standard. And again, licenses are a little different, landings are a little bit different, but. Uh, Alabama's trying to be very flexible in their um, their their requirements. Yeah, I think we're we're running the same thing. All right, I didn't know if you guys were having any of those issues or not. So, any other questions for Jeff? We'll move on to sportfish, James. You there? If you're talking, James, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. All right. I had to switch my phone, but when I muted that, I guess it muted everything. I don't know. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a report in your uh, briefing book under tab I. Um, after a final approval of the Guidelines for Marine Artificial Reef Materials, third edition at our March meeting. Uh, I made that available on the web, Commission's website and also provided that to ASMFC um, for their approval and distribution through their uh, groups because uh, it is a joint publication. Um, and as I've said before, moving forward, that's going to be a living document so that either one of the subcommittees, if new information becomes available, we can just update specific chapters within that. Um, I held the joint meeting of the two subcommittees in April virtually um, on that meeting. Uh, the, what we discussed was covered in the TCC report, uh, but we also discussed when we were going to try to get together again. Um, the group wanted to try to meet in conjunction with the Florida Artificial Reef Summit, which got moved in November. Uh, but as you heard in the Sea Grant report, um, because of the virus, that's had to go to a virtual format. Um, so we're going to be targeting um, spring of 2021 to have our next in-person meeting if conditions improve. Um, uh, through a partnership with the University of Southern Mississippi's Gulf Coast Research Lab, I was able to get out and actually start field testing some of the um, Gulf Artificial Reef Monitoring and Assessment Program components. Um, through those field testing um, activities, we highlighted some aspects of the data entry program that proved to be kind of cumbersome while processing collected fish. Um, and as a result of that, Joe Fair on our staff um, went through that program and developed version two of it um, <clears throat> to make it more user friendly and to minimize the amount of time that collected fish have to be on board the monitoring vessel. Um, also during those sampling events, um, we uh, noticed extremely low dissolved oxygen levels at um, several of the sampling locations. Um, so to better um, assess the water quality, um, including dissolved oxygen levels at artificial reef sites off the coast of Mississippi, um, looking at um, employing water quality monitoring multi-parameter data sons at several offshore sites. Uh, the data sons will be deployed on the bottom using an acoustic release system uh, so I don't have any entanglement issues uh, with a surface buoy and a mooring line system. Um, looking at using the VR2AR um, coded acoustic fish tag receivers um, in order to collect fish tag data as well um, in areas where fish tag receivers are not currently located. Hopefully that could help out any other um, state sport fish restoration program that are tagging fish that may be out there. So. Um, and the data sons will be deployed year round in order to assess seasonal changes in water quality at the site and to determine the prevalence and duration of low dissolved oxygen events. Um, Joe Ferrer on our staff also 
um, similar to what he did with the aquaculture website, um, updated our website for this um, monitoring program uh, and integrated that interactive map, which will be used to distribute all of the data that is collected through this effort. Um, and we're continuing to look for ways to increase the funding within uh, the sport fish restoration program here at the commission um, so we can help to support and coordinate more sport fish restoration activities across the Gulf of Mexico. And that concludes my report. Thank you, sir. Any questions on sportfish for James? All right, James, you're up again. Aquatic nuisance species. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a report on your briefing book under tab J. Um, I hosted the spring Gulf and South Atlantic Regional Panel meeting, again, virtually back in April. Um, we focused on a discussion about a model bait regulation project, which is one of the small grants programs, uh, projects that are being funded, and also emerging issues with ANS in our eight member states. Um, the National Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force canceled their spring meeting due to the virus. Um, continuing, as uh, Glenn Constant pointed out, we are continuing our partnership with the Fish and Wildlife Service to administer um, the ANS Small Grants Program. Um, over the last six years of that program, we've been able to fund 39 projects totaling $850,000 um, all across the Southeast region. Um, and been able to do some really good research with that. Uh, I also I worked with the regional um, office staff to get um, some more funds added into the program uh, for this year, but due to a number of uh, circumstances with this year's uh, situation, um, those funds will just be added to next year's RFP um, and we'll be able to fund hopefully more projects and a little bit larger projects next year with all that money. Um, continuing our work with Mississippi DMR um, to support the Jimmy Sanders Memorial Lionfish Challenge. We're in our third year of that. Uh, due to current circumstances though, we did switch over to a virtual tournament this year. Uh, utilizing Fishing Chaos, who's been um, the app that we've been using um, to run the tournament anyway, but they switched over to a virtual format for the tournament for us. And um, the new format is working very well. We've actually already surpassed last year's numbers, um, and those efforts are made possible with our support of our sponsors, who are Ingle Cooler, Neuretic Diving, Zookeeper, and Fishing Chaos. Um, I am chairing the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force's Prevention Committee, uh, which is tasked with addressing five key outputs from the Task Force's strategic plan. Um, that committee is focused on uh, our activities this year on four of those outputs. Uh, the first being work with applicable federal agencies and responsible industry sectors to make organisms and trade importation data electronically available. Um, We've been working with members of our committee, industry, and the USGS um, to develop a model database that could uh, be used potentially to do, track those imports. One of the um, larger importers provided us with a species list that we could use as a model uh, to start pulling together that um, database with help from the USGS NAS database. Uh, the second output we've been working on is assess new introductions to determine where prevention measures may have been lacking, been ineffective, or resulted from gaps in authority. Uh, so I worked with USGS on that with the NAS database. Uh, they queried their uh, last 10 years of new introductions both uh, to the U.S. and to uh, new introductions to states. Uh, and not surprisingly, um, kind of getting back at the last objective with the imports, um, out of 42 new introductions to the U.S., 30 of those were the result of uh, human-mediated introductions or released um, into the U.S., and 25 of those species that were released were exotic species, which were most likely coming through the pet trade. And out of the 48 new introductions to a state, 31 of those were uh, through the pathway of release, and 26 of those are exotic species. Um, the third output we're working on is um, evaluating the and implement the roles and responsibilities of the task force under the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act. Um, 
the first step of that is being handled by the EPA and the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, and actually, the EPA just released uh, last week the pre-publication version uh, of the proposed rule, Vessel Incidental Discharge National Standards for of Performance. So once those standards are in place, uh, the Coast Guard has other the uh, mechanism in place of how they'll enforce those. Then we will be assessing how the task force can kind of fit into that program. And then the final output we're working on is enter into national prevention practices and agreements with natural resource agencies and responsible industry sectors that consider invasion risk within operations. And we developed a subcommittee um, under our committee to develop an RFP, uh, which will be looking to have a national seaplane risk assessment uh, conducted. Uh, we're close to finishing that RFP now, and hopefully we'll have that out um, released here in the next month or so. I will be hosting the next uh, panel meeting virtually uh, on December 17th, and the task force is going to be holding its fall meeting virtually on December 10th or 8th through the 10th. And that concludes my report. Thank you, sir. Any questions for James on the aquatic nuisance? Appreciate it. Uh, Greg, you're up. Fisheries yes, thank information. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, hope my audio doesn't go out on me. My internet's been fluctuating here a little bit. So, um, yeah, tab K in your briefing book will give you a look at the FIN proposed funding activities for 2021. Um, based on our analysis, as you heard during the State Federal Fishery Management Committee report, we believe we can fully fund all of the proposed activities for calendar year 2021. In my six years as program manager, I've never been able to say that. And um, in speaking with my predecessor, Dave Donaldson, he said that has not happened since the inception of the Gulf In program, which would be back into the 90s. So um, I believe that, that part of that is due to um, increases we've seen in some of our congressional funding. And I think that's due to some of the hard work of many of y'all that take trips to Washington and, and talk to folks about the importance of, of managing the resources in our region and the resources needed to do that properly. So um, just for me and the, and the project team that work on all of these fishery dependent um, data collection programs, we say thank you because uh, we've never been able to say that before and I hope we can say it for many more years into the future. So um, just two things. So yeah, COVID is ongoing. It's had um, impacts on all of the fishery dependent programs. Some as minor as just some, some of the state partners not being able to access sites because of social distancing rules. Others as significantly impacted as short and moderate term full shutdowns. Um, but I commend all of our partners for working hard to try to implement some, some rules and guidelines To, to get people back out in the field and keep them safe at the same time. Um, from a recreational data standpoint and a commercial data standpoint, uh, data still is being collected and it's flowing into to staff here and we're, we're processing that and making it available for, for science and management. And um, um, I just appreciate everyone's hard work to, to keep everyone safe, but at the same time, um, try to do what we can to collect some data during this weird year. So, um, so with all those programs ongoing, the one thing we are working hard on right now is um, some data, some technology improvements and some strides forward to get away from paper reporting. You may have uh, heard Darren's report in the TCC summary about our move away from paper data collection methods on the MRIF APIS survey, the Dockside Creel survey. And we're also doing the same thing with the CFIRE Dockside Validation Survey, creating electronic applications where field samplers will be using electronic tablets to collect that data. Um, it'll improve quality control at the point of, of data collection. Those data will feed to the commission and then we make that data available to the necessary um, partners that need those data for, for um, analysis purposes. It's definitely creating some challenges and um, 
some of us are stepping outside of our knowledge and, and comfort base a little bit, but um, it's going to be an improvement. And, and on the APIS side, for sure, I just wanted to give a thanks to our, our partners at the Atlantic Coastal Cooperative Statistics, Statistics Program. They're sharing a great deal of knowledge of already having done this, and um, they're helping us get up to speed really quickly and also really helping us keep costs down with the amount of, of, of knowledge and product they've shared with us to get us, um, to get us rolling. Um, our hope is to have both of those stood up, up um, January 1 of the new year, but um, COVID has slowed that down too and we're running out of time, but we're working hard on that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm just gonna stop there and, and conclude my uh, FIN committee report with that. Thank you, Greg. Anybody got any uh, comments for Greg or any questions on the FIN? All right, next we'll um, move to, oh, go ahead. Oh, this is Julie Simpson from ACCSP. I just wanted to say we are always happy to coordinate with the other FINs. Hmm. Oh, thanks, Julie. Thanks, Julie. So next, we're going to move on to Charlie. Welcome, Charlie, to the commission. I know they've thrown you in on fire right off the bat here. You've only been here about a month. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the one of the things I wanted to do here today was kind of take the opportunity to introduce myself. Um, you guys probably noticed a, a new name and a new program under the agenda. So uh, my name's Charlie Robertson, and I'm excited to be the, the newest member of the commission team here. Um, and I'll be working on the newly established fisheries restoration pro program here at the commission. Um, on the agenda, we've got it listed as the Bear Trauma Project. That is kind of the short name that we've we've dubbed for it because it's got quite of a quite a long name. Um, but the official title of the program or the initial project that the program is going to be working on is the reduction of post-release mortality from bear trauma in Gulf of Mexico reef fish recreational fisheries. So um, it's quite a long name, but um, so the, the primary partners on the project are gonna be the commission. We'll be working with NOAA as well as the Florida Sea Grant, uh, which Laura uh, previously mentioned their role in the project. Um, in case anybody's wondering where the funding is coming from, it'll be part of the Deepwater Horizon Natural Resource Damage Assessment funding stream. So just kind of like the the project title alludes to is the the main objective of the project will be to reduce the post mortality post release mortality um, through research and developing gulf wide best handling practices for reef fish in the gulf of mexico um, one of the main targeted species that we're going to be uh, hopefully getting some information on will be the red snapper obviously but we'll be looking to get some information on some of the other important reef fish species in the Gulf that are affected through the recreational fisheries. But we'll also be providing outreach and education information to increase some angler awareness and knowledge on how to use and implement best handling practices. And then we'll also be hoping to make equipment and tools available to the recreational reef fish anglers so that they can effectively implement the best handling practices and procedures that we'll hopefully get to in this project. And just kind of a quick status on where the project is right now. Some of you may have gotten in your inboxes uh, an email from me, I guess, last week or the week before. We, we published the first RFP, and we're hoping to solicit some pre-proposals for research projects that will explore different aspects uh, affecting post-release mortality on the Gulf Reef fish species that were uh, listed in the, one of the NOAA reports. So we also have that on the website as well for people to be able to access it in multiple avenues. We're currently developing an RFP for a survey on angler attitudes and opinions regarding fish to sender devices. Uh, we hope to publish that soon. We're working with the Florida Sea Grant on that. Um, and then we'll be reaching out to the state managers here pretty soon in the next few weeks to, to get feedback from them on the direction of the project and to hopefully find some ways in which they would like to be involved in the project moving forward. I think it's gonna be very critical to the success of this project on having them involved and participate however we can. And, and of course, we'll do whatever we can to facilitate that as well. Uh, it's quite a large scale project. It's gonna be going on for 
about the next eight years uh, at least, and then we hope to in the future expand on that as well. Um, and I think Laura had also mentioned earlier that Florida Sea Grant will be hiring an outreach coordinator here pretty soon, hopefully by the end of the year to begin um, developing some of the outreach strategies that, that we'll plan to implement through the project. So uh, to conclude, it's a really exciting opportunity uh, for the fishery. It's a, a really great project and we're glad to be working on it here at the commission. Uh, we'll keep you guys updated and informed on the project as it develops. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer those. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Any questions for Charlie? All right. Well, I'd like to I'd like to thank Steve, Jeff, Greg, James, and Charlie on all the hard work they put into these programs and the very detailed reports. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, from here, I guess we're going to move on to item 12, Dave, and I'll let you take it over. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, earlier earlier today, uh, the executive committee uh, met and talked about uh, uh, several several issues. Uh, the a report has was distributed uh, about uh, 1030 this morning and uh, the the recommendations of the executive committee uh, regarding the the uh, 2021 budget and staff compensation is is in there so um, we need a we need a motion to accept that report and accept those recommendations. Motion to accept the report. You're muted, Dan. Sorry, waited for the last minute. So I have a second from who? I got Jason, but I didn't get anybody else. This is Reed. I'll second. All right, thanks, Reed. So I have a motion by Jason, a second from Reed. Any further discussions? Any opposition? Hearing none, the motion passes. So we'll move on to item 13, uh, state director's reports. So all detailed state reports were submitted before the meeting are in the briefing books. Um, I think you, Dave, I think you had some suggestion on how you wanted to do this. Uh, it was just, it, it, all it was was um, just kind of to, as we've done in the past to kind of hit, hit the highlights of, of the reports, not, not necessarily cover everything, but, but uh, also kind of give everyone an update on, on the impacts of COVID, that COVID's had on, on, on the, the fisheries and, and uh, within, within your state when you give those reports, but just, you know, keep it high level and brief. If, and if people want more detail, they can, they can refer to the report, report or ask questions. Okay, I guess I'll start. I mean, I'm gonna keep it pretty brief for myself. Um, we're working on a couple different uh, disaster projects. We got Hurricane Emma, we're still working on. We got Michael, we got Cares, and we'll probably have Sally here pretty soon. Roy mentioned the Southwest Red Tide one. We haven't seen anything on that yet. We're still waiting on the spend plan for Michael to be approved. The Cares Act one was finally approved, so we'll start sending applications out here probably in the next two weeks. Um, we've given around $24.9 million in direct payouts for uh, commercial fishers and wholesale dealers and charter guys out of um, Irma. So the next projects will be more of the, the infrastructure for wholesale dealers and some marine debris cleanup stuff. So we'll finish that project up we hope by next fiscal year. Um, in the regulatory world, we got a lot going on. We closed Apalachicola Bay oysters. We're working on flounder. Uh, we got some federal consistency um, stuff going on on the Atlantic side and working with South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council on that. Um, some modified hook requirements. Um, we're we're going to take to the next commission meeting. We're going to be taking uh, terrapin excluder devices for all blue crab traps um, statewide. We're going to be taking that to the commission. Um, we got some stone crab stuff going on, so we're pretty much going to open all of the stone, or all of the trap uh, rules that we have and, and go through them. We're going to talk. We're going to be bringing Goliath grouper talks back up. We're going to be talking about casitas down in the Keys. 
Um, so that's pretty much all I have. This is just quick and down and dirty, but it's all in the report. Scott, you want to go? Sure. Um, so this last year, Alabama uh, created a, a Gulf Reef Fish endorsement uh, to for fishing uh, for any of the, the reef fish species. Uh, we actually had a pretty good year, I think, for our, our first year in sales, uh, about 24,000. So it helps provide some funding to do research, but it also helps us identify how many people are really participating in that fishery because there are, uh, the only exempted persons are those under the age of 16. So, uh, so everybody else has to have one, including commercial and for hire. Um, we are completing some of our surveys to expand our artificial reef zone by 110 square miles. I hope to have that done here in the near future. Uh, we've done some work on our inshore reefs uh, within the nine mile zone. Uh, we're actually scanning those now for damage from the hurricane. So uh, I think they're all still there. They just may not be in the exact spots we first deployed them in. Um, we had a pretty good oyster season last year. For the year before that, we were didn't even open. So uh, we recently opened to oyster harvest uh, this last week. Um, we've had really good participation, uh, good harvest, and we're we're hoping to make it through Christmas, but it's hard to tell uh, uh, an impact of COVID is, uh, you know, we don't know, uh, you know, what employment looks like for people. So uh, yesterday we had 99 uh, catchers out there working. And so uh, it's been a long time since we've had numbers like that. Uh, so uh, it's just it's just a hard thing to, to quantify uh, until the season's over. Uh, this year we released uh, some about 10,300 pompano and 58,000 spotted sea trout from our Claude Petit Mariculture Center. And we are anticipating a flounder spawn in December. And uh, we've, we've had uh, great success uh, with a private partner, uh, private public partnerships with people to gain uh, uh, the, the stock, the brood stock with the uh, fishing tournaments and local fishing guides providing the, the product to put in our, our Mariculture Center. So we're very proud of that. Um, some of the other COVID, imp oh, one other thing, we've expanded our coastal remote monitoring system, which is our camera system at uh, like public access boat ramps and some other high traffic vessel areas. And we're uh, working to add some artificial intelligence to that so that we can count some boats and things and some more monitoring that's available in there. So it's a uh, uh, a, a pretty interesting system and along with that we added a, we affectionately call our turtle cams uh, we have a turtle dolphin funding and we have some remote cameras that are kind of like you see in the in the walmart parking lot but these can um, broadcast through wi-fi or uh, cellular or our internal network of our other cameras as long as they're in sight of one of the the receive radio receivers and they can run indefinitely on the the solar power and we can access them remotely. Uh, they have uh, thermal capabilities to operate at night. And so we're gonna use that to monitor some, uh, some nesting and potential uh, things as like uh, negative dolphin encounters uh, and interactions uh, over the next few years. Uh, COVID impacts are, uh, we actually saw a dip in licenses initially, and then they went up. And so we actually saw an increase in license sales due to COVID is what we feel uh, because we considered it a safe and healthy activity to be outside. And that also impacted our red snapper fishing season with uh, some record weekends when we first opened in the very beginning of the year. So we uh, closed down a few days early. Uh, we had a residual catch uh, that we were going to fish this last weekend. Uh, then another hurricane came. So we're going to be open on weekends from now on until the catch has been, or until our allocation is complete. Um, we had a reduction in the number of APIS assignments due to COVID by 27%, um, 24 uh, canceled assignments to collect hard parts, you know, the odalis and fin clippings. And uh, we had several outreach events canceled due to COVID. Uh, we're pretty much back up and running with some protocols in place. Our, our staff is, is pretty comfortable and the public seems comfortable with with what we're doing. And then just a few quick hurricane impacts. Uh, again, both both facilities were without power for a little while. Um, we uh, uh, probably around a million dollars worth of damage between the two facilities. Dolphin Island, probably with the most, uh, uh, some, uh, we're gonna have to replace the roof. Uh, we lost all of our enforcement docks and uh, uh, 
We had some damage to the saltwater intake over at the Gulf State Park Fishing Pier, which is, uh, matter of fact, just uh, an interesting note. On that Wednesday, the hurricane hit. The Gulf State Park Fishing Pier was to be uh, reopened after a $2.4 million renovation, and now it is closed uh, until we figure out how to rebuild that thing because it got busted in half by the hurricane. So that concludes my report. Thanks, Scott. Do you have any questions or comments? I guess we'll move on down to Mississippi, Paul. Hey, uh, can y'all hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, I had to switch devices. I was just checking. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, again, the report on the briefing from the state of Mississippi is in the program. Uh, it gives our current programs and bureau activities uh, highlights from such. And some additional is... Uh, 2011 uh, Bonnie Carey payouts went out uh, earlier this year. Uh, direct payments to oystermen and crabmen, uh, fishermen. The CARES Act was approved about 48 hours ago. Oh, we lost you. We lost you, Paul. Still not there. Oh, shit. So he's talking, but I can't hear him. Do you want me to move on to Jason, or what do you want to do, uh, Dave? Yeah. Hey, can um, you all hear me? Oh, now we can. You're back. Now we can. Okay, I apologize. When did I get cut off? Pretty early on. About the CARES Act. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll start right at right at the CARES Act. So it was um, the CARES Act was approved about 48 hours ago. Uh, let's see. The 2019 Bonnie Carey Spend Plan uh, was approved by our governor, and is uh, next step will go back to now for the spending plan approval, and then the oyster. Within oyster restoration, uh, we did a 1 million adult oyster deployment uh, because of massive uh, mortality of the Bunny Carey Spillway. In 2019, so we deployed a million adult oysters for spawning potential in uh, high, uh, high success areas. Uh, we're currently anticipating a uh, winter or early spring uh, set seed oyster deployment of 60 million seed oysters that are set on uh, colch to be put out on uh, hopefully this winter or early spring. Uh, multiple colch deployments uh, using internal as well as NIFWF funds uh, for uh, different colch types. And then U.S. Uh, was awarded their restore funds to build their hatchery um, to provide larvae for the, uh, for the future of our oyster restoration. Uh, for Dave Donaldson's uh, request for COVID impacts, um, there is a uh, Pretty much, we had about three weeks where MRIP was suspended for intercepts itself, which isn't, isn't too bad when you think about it. And that was in the springtime. Uh, stock enhancement of spotted sea trout uh, at our hatchery was canceled for 2020 because of proximity uh, protocols of COVID-19. Um, uh, the Grand Bay near uh, has been closed to visitors and all outreach has been canceled and or converted to virtual. Uh, the alternative bulkhead design training classes that I think I spoke uh, at, at the last uh, Gulf State meeting in the TCC uh, committee, uh, those classes have been postponed because obviously of proximity concerns with COVID-19. And just uh, some quick little numbers, uh, just reductions, the up-to-date numbers for commercial landings uh, because of COVID uh, reductions in landings uh, compared to a five-year average to date. So compared to uh, October catches over the last five years, there's been a 14% reduction in crab landings, 40% reduction in finfish, 57% reduction in shrimp, and uh, dealer processors are currently at about a 52% reduction. Uh, again, that's to date uh, this year compared to date of uh, prior years, uh, five year priors. So that pretty much concludes uh, the background that I wanted to provide with the state report. Again, uh, a lot of the more details are in the in the briefing book itself. And I apologize for getting cut off. No, that's all right. Thanks. I appreciate you doing it. Sure. Any Dave, questions? I'll answer. 
Any questions? If not, we'll move on to Jason, Louisiana. All right, thank you, Dan. Um, I'll try to be brief as well um, and cover most, most of our, our COVID-related impacts. Um, as, as, um, as expected, landings across the state and, most, and all of our fisheries are down. Um, blue crab is down 15%, again, compared to that same five-year five year average. Um, however, our value is up. Um, the value actually increased by 3.5%, and that's just due to a uh, um, 17% increase in price per pound that we're seeing, um, which we, we, we're still trying to figure out what that is and why, why that price is so high. Um, you know, obviously, with demand being down, that, that's why we see a lot of these landings going down. But, um, our blue crab fisheries aren't aren't suffering too bad at the moment. Um, let's see, oyster. I'm sorry, I'm gonna do shrimp. Um, shrimp has has decreased um, overall by 48%. Um, the brown shrimp landings are down um, to 8.7 million pounds, down from 22.9 million, and uh, white shrimp are down. Um, <clears throat> to 12 million pounds compared to, let's see, I'm sorry, they were down 28% um, from their five-year average. Oyster landings are down 74% uh, compared to their five-year average. So this is this was our fishery that took the biggest hit this year um, due to the CARES Act. Um, it also might have a little bit to do with our oyster season this year. We only opened it up for eight days on the public grounds um, where, where dredging is allowed. We had a much longer extended season in Calcasieu Lake, but that's tongue only. So a lot of, a lot of uh, oysters don't really come out of that area. Um, but it, we were down to an eight day season on that. As far as our, our operations, um, you heard Jeff mention earlier that all, most of the CMAP cruises were canceled. So we followed along with that and, and uh, passed on doing those cruises. We, our field sampling, our independent sampling has continued on. Um, as far as I know, we haven't really missed any assignments um, for our independent sampling. Um, when it comes to Lacreel, we were able to com complete 784 out of our 800 assignments during, uh, during the COVID period. So we only missed 16 assignments. The impact to Lacreel from COVID can be seen in the, the difference between our uh, reported and our observed catch at the dock, um, we're sitting at about 52% um, of all of our uh, fish seen at the dock are actually observed and counted by our, our staff. Um, our goal is to usually stay above 80%. So we've seen um, a, a very large reduction in, in actual observed catch. And you can imagine that's because um, the public doesn't want us to get close enough for touching their fish. Um, so they're they're happy to tell us what's going on, but they don't want us looking at it. Let's see. We we've been working on some life history studies. Um, spotted sea trout's actually going to be finished up fairly soon. In fact, we might have a, a, a report um, already circulating for review. Um, we were working on a black drum life history study as well as a sheep's head life history study. Uh, both of those are now uh, delayed in the pandemic. We were not able to collect enough samples um, to, uh, to be able to estimate a spawning fraction and frequency. So we'll have to delay that till next year. Our oyster hatchery, not really COVID related, um, has been suffering again. I know I probably mentioned this for the last three years now. Um, we did not have a very good spring season. Um, we did a study this year with a private land-based hatchery um, in Baton Rouge, where we ran side-by-side side -by -side, um, side -side, uh, spawns and did some water quality tests, did some comparisons between our hatchery and their hatchery. I'm still waiting on the results for that, but the, the goal was to try and identify um, what the issues are that we're having. We were hoping for a pretty good fall season and uh, Mother Nature and all the hurricanes uh, kind of shut that down. I think we've evacuated that place four times um, this season, and every time we evacuate, we pretty much lose our our uh, our, our algal culture. Um, it just goes down, um, and so they have to start start that process over when they come back. 
Um, but even still, we've been able to do a few spat on shelf projects. Um, CARES Act money related, um, we, I know this is outside of the reporting period, but um, we opened it up uh, late September. We're scheduled to close on the 26th of this month, but um, we're also looking at an extension more than likely um, due to the to the hurricane impacts that we've had. So we'll, be, we'll probably be extending that very soon. Um, we are running into some technical issues. Um, you know, those are always expected, but uh, as much as we've tried to try and identify every every issue we can run into, um, things are not going as smoothly as we hoped. So hopefully things will pick up for us there um, when we get past those issues. We are still planning um, for our the $58 million that was awarded to the state um, for the 2019 Bonnie Carey flood. Um, we're hoping to have a spend plan submitted to NOAA sometime early next year, the end of this year. Um, obviously, that got put off to the side when the CARES Act was passed, so we focused on that first and started working, uh, recently started working on that uh, that flood spend plan. We've also got a bunch of projects going in um, that are related to NERDA funds uh, from the BP oil spill. Uh, we've Recently had our oyster projects approved. Um, we've got 10 years worth of funding for oyster hatchery approved now. And we've got about $5 million of culture plants that we're uh, either putting in by the end of the year or early next spring. They're, they're working on putting them out for bid now. So we have a lot of things going on and we're fully expecting um, we'll be dealing with some hurricane uh, disaster stuff um, in the near future, working on that as well. So. You know, if we could just have a couple normal years where we don't have to worry about handing money out or, or trying to try to rebuild anything, I, that would be nice. But uh, that's that's where we're at. If y'all have any questions, let me know. Any questions for Jason? Yeah, hopefully hey, we keep. Hopefully, you know, you know, normal. Do y'all you, you have like a regulatory definition of normal? If so, I want to I want to copy that in Alabama. I mean, things have been so abnormal for so long. I think that now now is probably more normal than. All right, no more no more questions. We'll move on to Robin. Robin, you on? Did he drop off, Dave? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So, sorry. Um, yeah, no, um, I, I won't read the report, but there's at least three things in there that I will highlight because we probably talked about them in, in an earlier time frame. Uh, the first, Steve mentioned how uh, Several of the states had some flounder regular or flounder interest in research, and and certainly we had a, a rules package go before our commission in the spring uh, that was passed, and so part of that rule package took effect September one, and that was an increase in a minimum size limit on flounder from 14 to 15 inches. Um, as part of that, also we currently have a um, a a November to December 15th two fish bag limit where the where the bag limit reduces from five to two fish during that time frame. And we had proposed to have a full closure during that six week time frame. Uh, and because of COVID related issues and economic impacts to local areas, um, that, that did not take effect September 1, but it will be taking effect September 1 of 2021. So it, it did pass, but it just delayed implementation for a year. Uh, the other thing that was in front of our commission in the spring was oyster mariculture and and uh, the regulations uh, and the and the setup of that from the authority granted us from the legislature was was uh, passed by our commission uh, and since then we've been working to get those um, basically regulations codified and we managed to do that and we now have and are accepting applications uh, with a web-based presence where people can download applications and information on our website about that as well. And we'll be continuing to work with potential applicants on 
um, finding areas that may be suitable and then helping them go through that application process. And then lastly, from the report that I'm going to mention, uh, fortunately, uh, our crab trap cleanup did happen pre-COVID. Uh, we had that scheduled for Feb February 21st to March 1st, and and uh, the good news was we had a good weather event during that, that weekend. That's a highlight for many of our volunteers, and we collected over 2,000 traps, so we're we're always proud of that initiative. Um, like Alabama, one of the other things we noticed in our license trends, and, and we, we've heard about it anecdotally, but we actually saw it in licensing trends, and we closed out the August, uh, basically September 1 to August 31st of 2020 license year, closed out on a, on a higher note as compared to the previous year, uh, especially in our fishing license uh, category. And amazingly enough, the first month of this year, September, already has us at a at a overall uh, almost 10 percent higher rate of volume in in fishing licenses sold so uh, we're looking forward to hopefully uh, maintaining that trend uh, for a longer period of time not just during covid related times um so lastly that was the good news of covid the bad news of course that we all felt some was how it impacted our operations and like many of you certainly about the middle of march uh, basically, all of our outward-facing facilities in the department closed down, and for us, that included our visitation at both Sea Center Texas and MDC, and really any of our facilities, if, even though most of them aren't visitation centers by any means, but we basically removed the public from being able to come into those. Um, and with that, then our sampling also at the end of March, our resource uh, sampling, basically our fishery independent sampling, was halted and we basically resumed those operations fully as of June 1. Uh, then in addition to that, our fishery independent sampling, our krill, not necessarily our fish house visits, but our krill uh, basically went to a level where we still met, where we still interviewed people, where we still got fishing pressure at the sites that we were at, but we weren't basically uh, measuring fish uh, for that two month period as well. Um, and then uh, during that time, we of course kept up our rove counts and those sorts of things. Um, in addition to that, um, of course, the, the hatchery uh, visitor centers opened back up about the end of um, about the end of May or beginning of, of June as well. Uh, so we're back really at full speed, but following COVID-related guidelines there at those locations. Uh, and then kind of another thing that happened with COVID that we're proud of is as many of you know, we have a pretty significant sea turtle monitoring uh, and nesting uh, um, uh, effort that goes on, on in our Texas coast, uh, mostly done by universities and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And during the, the kind of COVID shutdown time, um, many of those universities were completely uh, told to, to abandon all work. Uh, and fortunately for, for them and us, we were able to partner with them uh, and use some of our staff to continue that work during that shutdown. It, it really is work that can be done basically by one person uh, patrolling the beaches uh, and, and trying to identify where sea turtle nests are, and we were able to continue that during that time, and we've since been able to hand that back off to them again, but, but, but nothing was lost during that time in that respect. So uh, with that, that will conclude my report and be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Robin. Did anybody have any questions? I appreciate everybody uh, giving their state reports. Um, so now we'll move on to number 14. Nancy, you still hanging with us? Actually, Dan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover it. Uh, Nancy's still on, but uh, because, of, uh, because of COVID, uh, um, we, we're going to keep the same rotation uh, with our meetings, and, and we are hopeful that we'll have a have a face-to-face -face March meeting but uh, in Florida somewhere. But... Uh, uh, obviously, that that remains to be seen. Um, we are uh, we're planning to planning to have a face to face, but uh, as uh, as it gets closer, we'll probably have another call of the executive committee to, and and make a determination of what's what what's the the best way to proceed and and the safest way to proceed. I, I'm hopeful that that. Uh, we'll get to see each other in person, but, uh, I, you know, right now I'm, I'm with everything that's going on. I'm just not, I'm just not sure. 
But, okay. And, and then in October, uh, we're, we'll meet in Texas somewhere. So we'll we'll get we'll get together with our Texas folks and figure out. Uh, um, hope, hopefully by then we'll actually be me meeting face to face. But you know who knows with the way things the way things have been going. Okay, sounds good. You want to move on down to fifteen to publications and web stats. Yeah, um, the the information is 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 in your uh, in your briefing book uh, on on the pubs and web stats. I you know we I'm not really gonna I don't have a presentation or anything. I just wanted to make you aware of it. It's a list of all our publications, and then and then Joe puts together a, a, a stats on our on our on our website. Um, but uh, if <laughs> if you could take a look at it, that or or if you've taken a look at it and have any questions, I'll be I'll be happy to uh, uh, answer any questions if there are any. Any questions for Dave? And you guys are quiet today. We're moving on to the most important part of this now: election of officers. So we need to go for a chair, first vice chair for Alabama, second vice chair for Louisiana, and then the Texas chairman rotation. I move to nominate Doug Boyd for chair from Texas. I'll I'll second that, Robin. So we have a motion for. Chairman of the Texas Rotation for Doug Boyd from Scott and a second from Robin. I guess it, uh, nomination and I, I move to close nomination. Hang on, we got somebody's not on mute. So Dave, what do we need to do? We need to have discussion first and then and do, then do the motion. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was there was a motion, and Scott moved to move to uh, close the close the nomination. So, uh, well, we just need a vote. Okay. So, how do I do that? Are there is there any opposition? Okay, I got you. If I'm hearing none, then the motion passes. Correct. So, congratulations, Doug. Well, thank you. I I got knocked off about four times in the last ten minutes, so I just got back on. I'm I'm assuming I I got nominated. Yeah, you did. Nominated and elected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what happens when that's what happens when you leave the room. It's <laughs> like a Baptist committee. You step out, you get elected. Yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> All right. So now we need to move on to the first vice chair. I'd I'd like to nominate Scott Bannon. I second that nomination. All right. So we're gonna close that, make a vote. So we have a nominate we're gonna have a motion to nominate Scott Bannon of Alabama by Chris and the second from Reed. Any further discussion? I move that the nominations be closed. Okay. Any opposition? Hearing none, the motion passes. Congratulations, Scott. So we need to move to second vice chair in Louisiana. I'd like to nominate right. Jason Froba from Louisiana for uh, second vice chair. And, and Dan, this is Robin, I'll second. Thank you. And I'll move to close nominations. Thanks, Scott. So motion by Scott to elect Jason and a second from Robin. And then in, any further discussion? Any opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. Congratulations, Jason. So, uh, from there, we'll move on to other business. Um, Dave? Uh, I, I, don't have, I don't have any other business other than to, to thank everybody for their, uh, the, both the commissioners and staff and, and uh, our presenters and, and, and other, uh, other folks in the audience. I, I appreciate y'all's time. 
uh, you know, I think I think it it went fairly well. We had some computer glitches and and audio issues, but uh, as virtual meetings go, I think it uh, it 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 went okay, and uh, I appreciate it. And hopefully, we'll we'll get to see you guys in person uh, in our next meeting. Yeah, I'd like to thank staff. It's it's hard to do these kind of meetings, and I think we're all getting kind of used to it. But they pulled it together. I didn't think there were too many glitches, other than me having to run it. Other than that, I appreciate everybody's patience and I hope everybody stays well and hopefully we'll see each other in the Keys in March. So, well, uh, you did a fine job, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thanks. Good meeting, Dan Don. Yeah. I agree. Right. And props for keeping your camera on the whole time. Yeah, ah, absolutely. I fear I tortured my big old fat bald head. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Yeah, Perfect. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.